Today is Wednesday, April 27th, 2022. Uh, we have a quorum present, and I would like to call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Chittenden Solid Waste District Board of Commissioners. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the agenda itself. Are there any requests to add or change anything on the agenda? Leslie, your hand is up. Yeah, I had a, a small thing on the minutes. We'll get to the uh, we'll get to that when we get to the consent agenda. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought that's where we were. No problem. Okay. Just on the agenda itself, any requests for additions or changes? Seeing none, the agenda stands approved as presented. Next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Are there any members of the public present via Zoom or on the phone who wish to address the Board of Commissioners? Oh, fuck. I am hearing nor seeing, I'm hearing none, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, we'll move then on to the consent agenda, which consists of the minutes of the March 23, 2022 regular board meeting, program updates, and a cost revision of a previously approved roll-off truck purchase. Uh, Leslie, you have a, uh, is this a comment uh, or, or a request to change the consent agenda? Pull something from it. The minutes. I have an, I have an item on the minutes. Uh, is it is it a minor correction or is it something a little bit more major that will require it to be? I pulled? don't know, <laughs> honestly. I'd like the I'd like the 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 advice of the chair and or yeah. anyone else on the board. What I'd like to. I also have one. Minor like to correction. identify my issue and then get whatever guidance. If people feel the minutes are fine as they stand, I'll accept that. I, but I did want to flag something. Okay, so um, what is that item? So um, under, let's see, it's on page three um, and under discussion, <clears throat> the third paragraph has um, some text that is in bold. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's pull this says, off. Pardon me? I, I, I think let's pull it off. It's not just a minor technical correction. So let's, I, I, what I'm understanding. So we'll pull out the minutes uh, and address that separately, Leslie. I, sorry to cut okay. you off, but I just think that'll be a little bit better way to okay. proceed. I also have a minor change, which I'll do at that point. So right now the minutes of the March 23rd, 2022 meeting will be um, removed from the consent agenda. Any requests to pull the program updates or the roll off truck revision? I'm hearing none. So the uh, those two items 3.2 and 3.3 are approved under the consent agenda. Now we'll move to item 3.1 the minutes of the March 23rd meeting. So Leslie, if you could resume. Uh, thanks, Paul. So what I wanted to call the board's attention to is this paragraph that's in bold under discussion um, where the last sentence is, quote, there is information in the, pa uh, sorry, in every uh, last two sentences, quote, there is information in the packet about the question of what point we would be able to pay the 1.2 million debt service and not have to subsidize in every instance but one, CSWD will generate enough revenue from the MRF to consistently make that payment. My recollection is that in the discussion, I questioned that statement. I felt that um, there was not sufficient information or analysis to support that statement. And I don't see my concern uh, reflected in the minutes. Okay, thanks. I think I have to refer that over to Amy um, to um, to get that incorporated. Um, sure, I can review the recording and uh, make an adjustment and send that out at the next meeting. So, Thank uh, you very no, much. I appreciate yeah. that. And then uh, also, Paul, I did just want to say on page five, the roll call voting. 
um, that's listed. We have vacant. We have vacant um, for some positions, and it really should say absent because vacant implies that there's not a board member. So, um, for Huntington, Richmond, and St. George, it will say absent rather than vacant. So I'll make those two corrections and bring this back for the May meeting. Okay, thank you. So at this point, uh, we will not be taking any action on the March 23rd minutes pending the corrections, which will be taken up next month at next month's board meeting. Um, the next item on the agenda, uh, item number four is the FY23 budget adoption. Um, I just wanna make a few introductory comments uh, on that before, um, before we're proceeding. Um, just by way of background, uh, the preliminary budget was presented on November, at our November 17th, 2021 meeting. Um, the board approved that uh, as solely a preliminary budget. January 26, 2022, there was a public hearing regarding the budget. Um, subsequent to that public hearing, um, staff worked um, on revising the budget and worked with the finance committee and tonight, um, the results of that work will be presented to the full board for its action. Um, it is um, really required at this point timing wise that the board approve a budget because once it's, it's approved, then Sarah needs to go out to all of the member, the, 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 legis the governing bodies at each town within the next 45 days to get their approval of this budget. And a majority of the town's uh, governing bodies must approve it before the, for this uh, budget to become uh, to be fully adopted and put into effect as of July 1st, 2022. So that's just by way of background. Um, also by way of procedure, what I'd like to do is ask Sarah to make a budget presentation and limit any uh, questions from board members until the conclusion of her presentation, have the budget proposed budget moved and seconded, and then we would open it up for discussion and debate. I feel with a very long agenda tonight, that's a better way to, um, to manage our time and keep us focused on the key questions. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah and staff for a presentation. Great, thank you very much, Paul. I will also apologize for some frogginess in my voice. I'm starting, I think, to feel the effects of um, the season. So i can bring up the PowerPoint here. <clears throat> Share screen. Uh, screen. Uh, screen. All right. Are we? Are we? With, uh, are we seeing the PowerPoint? Are we seeing the memo? PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Okay. So the fiscal 23 budget proposal, I do want to also apologize for a typo on the memo. It should say April 21, 2022. And this is indeed the fiscal 22 budget um, and not uh, the 22 budget, 23 budget, not the 22 budget. So I'm going to go through the slides. And as Paul said, then um, we'll have a motion and then open up for the discussion. Sarah, the screen right now is showing the next slide as well instead of the just the presentation. Yeah, okay, let me see here. Thank you. Let me get that. Oh, just more technical inadequacies here. Um, slideshow at the top, I think. Uh, in the middle there. Yep. Turn on. Oh. Um, if you go into the slideshow itself, start from the beginning, and when you that screen comes up, you'll see in your taskbar on the top it says display settings. Click that and then swap. Thank you. There you go. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Take two. So as we're um, as we were preparing fiscal 23's budget, uh, we were 
adjusting some several new realities. Um, and how long these realities will be in place is, is anyone's guess. Um, but as everyone is experiencing, um, so price index is very high, cost of living is high, expenses are, are increasing for everyone in every industry. Um, unemployment is, is very low. Um, there are lots and lots of pressures on um, every sector, it seems, um, in uh, 2022, in large part uh, due to continuing recovery from the pandemic. We're still in the midst of, of many of the effects. Um, and then just generalized changes that are happening um, around the world. We can't ignore some of the global effects. Uh, they certainly do have um, the reaches into certain parts of, of our operations, and we'll see that uh, as we go forward. But some of the things that um, I want to draw attention to, and that's why I mentioned that our expenses are uh, outpacing our revenue projections, and that is mainly because we are still being very conservative in our revenue projections, particularly when it comes to the MRF, the Materials Recovery Facility, and the sale of um, sorted recyclables. We have always um, used the practice of budgeting very conservatively on the average commodity revenue price, so that price we get per ton for the sort of material, because we do not control um, the marketing of the material. So we tend to hedge our bets. Um, that does serve us very well. Uh, I have uh, made it a practice to try to become a bit more realistic um, however, in this instance, with the volatility in the marketplace, um, we do like to hedge our bets conservatively. So having said that, uh, and I, I highlight that because this year's proposed budget is very, very tight um, with revenues and, and our expenses. There is room to move on that MRF line um, so that um, I would welcome conversation about that in particular as we get further down um, further down into the budget. Additionally being highlighted is that we are continuing in a very capital intensive period. In, you may have noticed in the, uh, the capital discussion, the, the four to five year plan, we do still have quite a bit of, um, of expenses listed in fiscal 24 for the MRF. That is in the event that um, the voters of Chittenden County do not approve uh, the bond that we'll be asking them for in November uh, to authorize us to, to spend the money to build a new MRF. If they do not vote for that, we do need to make um, some significant investment in the current facility to continue to be able to use it as a MRF. So the dollars that you see in the, the line item, the column for fiscal 24 for the MRF may not be necessary. Um, uh, and that is, again, one of the things that is, is not exactly within our control, um, uh, but we'll know more about that in November. The solid waste management fee, um, that is that fee that we uh, charge to haulers when they bring material to, for disposal to the landfill in Coventry. It has been $27 per ton uh, for the past eight or nine years. We are not recommending or, or uh, proposing an increase. Um, we do feel that the so always management fee revenue is sufficient for the needs and for the purposes that it serves, that serves for the district. And essentially, we are projecting that the fee and the tons um, subject to the fee will be flat for this upcoming year. There is uh, an uptick in construction in Chittenden County. There um, is, again, continued you know, resum resumption of normal activities, but it is not uh, not yet at the levels that we were seeing in fiscal 19. Um, so in part that, that's a good thing, right? We don't want to be generating excess waste um, and landfilling that. So what we're seeing, I think, is perhaps some leveling off and some normalization. Um, so that is where, you know, again, you see our actuals in, in calendar year 20, very close to the budget for last year, very close to the budget for this year. So essentially, that, um, that line item, that revenue stream is expected to be flat. For the materials recovery facility, the MRF, um, again, we are holding our tip fee at $80 a ton 
um, for this upcoming year. And again, that is the fee charged to haulers when they deliver collected recyclables to the materials recovery facility. Uh, we are also still budgeting um, the same amount of tons this year, upcoming year that we have for this current year, 47,500, um, subject to the tip fee. And again, this is where you know, I, meant, I want to focus in on that average commodity revenue that basically the blended price per ton, the value per ton of the materials that we sort. We market approximately 38,000 tons of material. So that is the amount that is subject to that $80 ACR. Uh, and there is some room uh, for movement. The ACR, the average commodity revenue for the past oh, three to four to five months has been well over $100. It's been um, routinely over $130. We know that that ebbs and flows and, and uh, goes up and down. We have been as low as a negative 45, negative 42. So um, for the price of paper and, and fiber products, for example. And that's really where the risk lies for CSWG. The amount of material that um, we process, between 75 and 80% of that material are fiber products, um, cardboard, paper, junk mail, et cetera. So because that, um, that stream does have some higher uh, ebbs and flows, that is the main reason we want to continue to be conservative. However, with the average commodity revenue for the first six months of this calendar year being um, right around 130, 135, we do recognize there is room for upward movement if the board decides that that's um, a direction they want us to go. For the organics diversion facility, um, we are anticipating um, proposing raising the TIF fee to $65 per ton. Um, this year is also a bit of a, an interesting year. Um, we did see last year a decrease in the inbound material, the food scraps. Um, the leaf and yard remains very stable. That has not changed in many, many, many years. But the food scraps does, um, does fluctuate. The main driver behind the sudden reduction that we saw this past year and um, that we're moderating for this upcoming year was the introduction of the depackaging facility in Williston that Casella built last year. Um, they were the largest uh, supplier or um, hauler that bringing us material uh, to the ODF. And when they um, brought their depackaging facility online, they redirected all of their organics to that facility. We have since recovered some of those source separated organics back to the compost facility, to ODF. Um, and we are anticipating you know, additional material coming back. So this is where we are, again, being conservative in budgeting approximately 4,400 tons of inbound food scraps. This is also not necessarily a bad thing. We were headed to a very untenable position just a couple of years ago before the depackaging facility came online um, to where we were in excess of, you know, nearly 7,000 tons. And, and we were really concerned that that was going to be unmanageable um, particularly as, as uh, Act 148 really kicked into its final high gear uh, with the landfill ban on food scraps. Our sweet spot is between 5,000 5, inbound and 6,000 inbound tons. So we are approaching that operational efficiency, that, that production sweet spot. Um, so we're, we're um, cautiously optimistic that we will be getting back into that, um, that area that we feel very, very confident um, it will again produce the amount of material that we know we can sell, uh, sell out of every year. And that is the goal to continue to sell food product um, and to be able to manage efficiently and effectively um, on, uh, on site. So we are, have increased again the tons a little bit, um, but again, are still being conservative. And not unanticipated is that compost sales will be leveling um, back to pre-COVID pre levels, maybe a little bit higher. And again, that is anticipated. When everyone was home uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and even this past year, uh, building gardens and um, growing food at home, everyone who bought, who was supplying compost and producing compost and top soil and garden mix was selling out completely. Uh, we were no different. So sales are incredibly robust for two years, which is fantastic. And now they're leveling off. 
Um, but again, coming back to a really good sales level. So we still feel like we're in a good place. Um, and uh, our, you know, we have great contact with our, our main customers, our main suppliers. Selling through Whole Fill outlets has been um, a major component for increasing our efficiency. And we are continuing to, uh, um, again, to, to reap the benefits of, of that change. Our drop-off centers, we're anticipating revenue um, inbound to PPs to be flat. Um, there, again, are components that we either are unable to charge for that we accept or that we choose to not charge a fee for. Um, we're anticipating for this fiscal year, keeping the bag pricing at the same level as fiscal 22. So for fiscal 23, the same as today. And we want to continue to analyze the BOC fee structure going into fiscal 23. We, we started on um, that process this year had um, a bit of fits and starts, admittedly. So we want to continue that process for the rest of this calendar year and then bring back um, some more conversations um, and have those conversations with, with the board uh, about changes that we may want to consider making. Um, expenses are up and due in large part to hauling fee increases and disposal fee increases. And we're also seeing that at, um, at the MRF. Um, this is the fifth year in a row that the DOCs are requiring a subsidy. And again, I think what you know, we're, we're seeing that more transparently now. Um, in prior years, uh, before I got here and in the first year that I was here, um, the special waste budget and the DOC budgets were essentially one. Uh, actually, the answers, they were, they were split. Um, so a lot of um, expenses that, uh, were tagged to the special waste budget, which was fully subsidized by the district, uh, essentially, were also kind of used by the DOCs. So it skewed um, uh, the, the relative uh, need for subsidy for the DOCs. We no longer do that. So this is, and you can see that it has been very consistent over the past you know, three years um, in the amount that is needing subsidy at the DOCs. And again, this is something that the board will need to continue to have conversations about what is the level um, of the DOCs that needing subsidy, um, you know, taking a look at that fee structure, taking a look at the materials that we charge for, taking a look at the services that we're providing. In addition, uh, one of the things that does directly affect very highly is that the DOCs are the heaviest users of the maintenance and roll-off um, services. And we do fully allocate those services out to according to use. And with the DOCs using 85% of those services, the bulk of the cost of that program does fall to the drop-off centers as an expense. Um, so that's where you're seeing um, those numbers now is in that expense total that includes um, the, um, the maintenance and roll-off charges, essentially charges. I want to highlight, again, talking about um, subsidy amounts by program and um, kind of putting that in perspective, and again, you know, the the board has has you know long um, looked at subsidies as particularly for something like the environmental depot as necessary. Uh, we want to make sure that these programs are um, adequately funded and supported, you know, in part by um, the either the solid waste management fee revenue or in part by excess revenue from other programs like the MRF. And you'll see that you know this year we're we're projecting. Um, the following uh, operating program um, uh, subsidies, and, and yet still we're able to contribute a little bit um, into the new operating reserve. And again, looking at the administrative programs, which are uh, fully funded by the solid waste management fee, um, we're looking at um, the, the draw on that, that revenue line just under $3 million and um, the revenue from the solid waste management fee is in excess uh, of the need from um, the administrative programs. And as always, we want to get to zero um, and that's uh, what we do as a municipality. So when looking at, uh, this is again, very high level, you can see that that gross profit or the income after um, cost of goods are, uh, subtracted from the revenue and the expenses, we are very, very close, very tight. Um, I will note that the packet um, misplaced the capital contribution from the MRF into the transfer 
uh, to the capital reserve, it should be above the line and as you see it here. Um, so you'll note that um, the capital contribution continues to only be at this point from the MRF. Um, I believe ODF was able to put some a very small amount um, in this current year's um, uh, capital reserve, but is not projecting to do that for the upcoming year. And there you see that maintenance allocation. And then uh, once that's added back in, you can see that the income after capital allocation is, is about a little over $300,000. The transfer of the bottom line to capital reserve, that's a little bit from property management. Um, and then again, the rest are um, just the, the kind of the standard um, transfers over to solids management fee, biosolids, operating and operating reserve. And we had, and that is new for us this year. We've implemented a, a change to our reserve programs as we've discussed um, several times uh, at the board. And that um, transfer to operating reserve is, is new in this budget. So doing some quick comparisons from um, this 23 budget to the current uh, fiscal 22 budget, <clears throat> excuse me, and we don't have the, um, the actuals yet, obviously, because we're still in, <clears throat> excuse me, the, now in the fourth quarter of fiscal 22. And you'll see that the, you know, the, again, the expenses are increasing by a significant amount. I wanna highlight the materials management increase, which is the overwhelming bulk of that expense increase. And that is, again, hauling services, um, increases at the transfer station and a projected increase in the processing fee uh, for the MRF. We have a um, third party operator who runs our MRF, Casella uh, operates that for us. And the contract that we have with them expires in June. And we are anticipating a, a significant increase in the processing fees that we pay to Casella for that service. So that is the bulk of the increase in our expenses are directly related to those two things. Another item to highlight, because it is new and different, and there's a, a large percentage increase, even though it's not a large dollar amount increase, is the creation of a new line item called community support. And that's where we're placing the community cleanup fund so that we can, we can um, better highlight the use of those funds to the public um, so that when they're looking at our budgets in future years, they'll be able to see exactly um, how much of that line item that CCUF was utilized um, uh, each year to year. So, and it was also a, a recommendation of our auditors that we fully fund the liability each year, not just the contribution that we intend to make, but the full um, liability of that, um, that fund. And because currently the practice is um, to allow communities to basically roll over or bank um, their annual allotment. We essentially have five years worth of, of allotments that we have to budget for as a liability, and that's what that is representing. Uh, I can't believe I just, oh, this is actually an old slide, I apologize. This should have been deleted. Um, so staffing changes, and I do want to excuse me, make note that um, the personal costs, the total compensation costs that are in the budget do reflect a continuation of the fiscal 22, the current year pay grade and step schedule with the addition of a 2% COLA. And this is per the recommendation of the finance committee. Um, when we did the Gallagher Flint study, uh, had that done last year and brought that to the board, um, it was a recommendation that an ad hoc committee be created to do a deeper dive into that study uh, take a look at it, consider the recommendations. Um, the ad hoc committee met about five times um, over the course of the winter and um, early early spring and had some recommendations to implement um, a different system. The finance committee uh, felt that there was more um, information that they needed before they were comfortable recommending that that go forward. So that is why in this budget, um, again, the personal costs are reflecting uh, the continuation of what we normally currently do. So we do have in the packet um, and provide some additional information per the request um, of some commissioners who are attending the meeting, um, the last finance committee meeting. So that information, that memo is um, included in the packet. It is at the end of your budget information uh, for, again, for discussion if, if you would like. Our um, total of uh, FTEs, full-time equivalents, are slightly down um, this year, and we do have some 
unfulfilled positions that we are budgeting going forward into uh, fiscal 23. But overall, the FTEs are, are again slightly down. So when we talk about allocations, really the only budget that we do fully allocate is maintenance and roll off. And essentially it is charged, like I said, according to usage. So the operations programs utilize the bulk of the, the services. Um, there's some that are, are allocated to um, admin, but mostly it is to operations. And then, you know, again, the just to, as a reminder that the support programs, which is essentially everything that is not an operation or facility is funded by the solid waste management fee revenue. And another reminder that our capital plan, we do not consider that um, a license to spend or authorization to spend. Capital projects, um, large purchases will always come back to the board for approval. Um, the, for the newer members of the board, um, spending limits, I can authorize purchases up to $50,000 as executive director between $50,000 and $100,000, um, I need to bring that um, request for authorization to the executive board. And then anything over $100,000 must come to the board for, uh, for approval. So again, as I mentioned, this is, we're in a very heavy, <laughs> heavy capital investment in infrastructure um, period. Um, we are drawing down on the reserves. Um, we will be building them up, um, in future years at a slower rate, but we'll also be drawing down at a much slower rate. Um, we are looking at just under $4 million um, for repairs, replacements, infrastructure. And again, that is, is, it is the high, very, very high end. Um, we always aim to um, come way under our capital spend. And where that is unavoidable, um, such as with the waterline project and you know, with the delays, and I mentioned the global pressures, the increasing costs, we will always come back to you and, and you know, talk about it and say, is this project still something that uh, we think is, is worthy of going on? The major investments that we're looking at for the next year um, is in the administrative building, uh, improvements to, I should have written out that acronym, to the Milton um, Dropbox Center, and site preparation for a new month. So for the funds, and again, we had mentioned that we have a, a new um, uh, system of our reserves. We added a couple of new reserves. We also uh, are implementing a priority list where we, we fund certain reserves in order. Um, one of the things I did want to, to draw your attention to, and again, well, two things, all the reserves are, um, are adequately funded according to the, the guidelines that we um, had established with the finance committee with the board, aside from capital, I think you can probably never have too much in capital, I suppose, um, as well as you can never have too much in landfill post closure. We are currently in or entering into year 27 of our 30 year um, post closure um, care requirement. So we currently have adequate funds to get us through to year 30, but the goal is to enter into custodial care. So what um, I've asked Josh and, and Janine to do is to really take a hard look at, at the, the closed landfills and to make sure that there aren't any issues that we need to be addressing uh, now, because we want to be able to enter into year 29, year 30, feeling very, very confident getting into custodial care. So you will see some activity associated with the landfill um, that are going to be generating that information, that data and potential action as needed. We've already identified some areas that need some minor repair. Um, so we'll be doing that over the course of the next few months because we had budgeted some of that in this fiscal year, as well as moving into uh, fiscal 23. So there'll be, I think some, some pretty significant projects, significant for the landfill, is not millions of dollars, but um, several tens of thousands of dollars, just to make sure that it is where we need it to be so that we can um, open close and go to custodial. And then again, this is the, the motion that um, we'll be asking for the board to, to move uh, and uh, post the the uh, making the motions and the seconding, open up for questions. I will stop my share. I think I can do that successfully. There we go. Thank you for your presentation, Sarah. Any, 
Uh, I, I take it there's nothing else at this moment that you'd like to add to, um, to what you've already stated. So then we're ready, as I previously stated, and Sarah just affirmed, uh, like to have a motion to approve the budget in order to get this on the floor for us to, to have a detailed discussion. Uh, the wording of the motion was uh, presented. Well, I, can, I can read it into the, into the record. <clears throat> Be resolved by the CSWD Board of Commissioners um, that approves the proposed fiscal 2023 budget and that it be submitted to the member legislative bodies for approval as presented. Thank you. Do we have a commissioner who is willing to uh, move that motion? So moved. Thank you, Ken. Second. Do we have a second? Thank you, Katie. Uh, we now have the, uh, the budget on the floor for discussion. Um, since this was originally reviewed or, or deeply reviewed by the Finance Committee, I would like to give Leslie an opportunity, if she so chooses, to offer any comments that she has about the, the budget um, as presented and the work that went into it. Thank you, uh, Paul. I, I appreciate um, that opportunity. And as um, Sarah has, I think, um, made clear to the uh, Board of Commissioners, this has uh, been a, a very challenging year for budget development not merely because of all the moving parts internal to um, the district, but because of the larger changes in the world out there. Um, you know, we started our budget work, what, back in December or January, and already some of the considerations that, um, we were grappling with, um, the landscape has changed very dramatically just in that, in that period of time. Um, just by way of example, uh, we will be discussing the compensation uh, issue later, but um, as you will note, as Sarah uh, told you, um, there is an assumption of a 2% cost of living adjustment on all wages and salaries in this budget. And that is increasingly looking unrealistic. And uh, I, for one, I, I, I'm not sure how we deal with this, um, but that was one of the major concerns of the finance committee. I wanna clarify that um, in seeking to keep the current um, wage and salary structure, um, we had a number of concerns, only one of which was the uh, impact of COLA going forward and whether that 2% was going to be realistic. Looking at all the global economic forecasts. And just today, I sent Sarah uh, the latest um, forecast from the World Bank, which is really quite dire. Um, that 2% COLA, to me anyway, and to a lot of observers, is um, looking very, very iffy. And so when we come to consider um, our compensation outlook. And remember that this is a budget in which the, expen the forecast expenses are considerably higher than the forecast revenue already. If we wanna factor in, let's say a 4% COLA, there's, there's going to be a major impact on this budget. And I'm not sure how we deal with that, honestly because of the need to take something to all the towns. And uh, this, is, this is absolutely unprecedented now. And, and Paul and anyone else, I, 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 think, I think whatever we bring to the towns has to have some caveats attached to it um, because three months from now, when the um, Federal Reserve raises interest rates, um, when we see what's happening to the cost of living in the CPI uh, that we use for our cost of living adjustments, uh, 
the whole landscape could be totally different even than it is today, let alone to when we started working on the budget. So uh, I think there has to be some conversation amongst us as how we prepare for that, to my mind, likely eventuality. The other thing that is, um, I, I ha also have a, a little bit of a process question, Paul. Um, in our packet, um, we have a memo from Nola and Sarah on the budget. Um, this is very different from the overview presentation that Sarah gave us. And I, by the way, Sarah, I want to compliment you on, on the clarity and succinctness of that presentation. That was, that was a really nice job. Um, but my question is whether this memo to us dated April 21st is expected to be the basis for some kind of letter or presentation to the towns or whether this is purely for the benefit of the Board of Commissioners. Because if it's something that's likely to go to the towns, then I would have some specific comments on some of the substance in that memo. So could we, okay, could we yeah. understand what, what this, you know, what this April 21st, is this purely internal or is this con something that's gonna be the basis of something that goes to the towns? Uh, Leslie, uh, thanks. You've, you've raised, I think, two, two core questions. Uh, I, before we get to, to, to um, next commissioner's questions, uh, let's just stay with this for a moment. Um, um, I think we'll start with your second question. My comment, and then turn it over to, to, to Sarah, is uh, ultimately we're going to be voting on a dollar, dollar item uh, a, or the, the dollars presented in this budget. Um, not a memo. So I, I would characterize whatever um, uh, memos are that that's informational. Sarah can clarify what the intent is. But ultimately, uh, we're voting on 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 a dollars and cents budget that um, can be presented to the to the towns um, for their approval. So let's stay with that question. Then Sarah, maybe you can address the question about the memo. Sure. Um, and you may recall that that I started this kind of longer version um, with our, our second COVID budget uh, because there were so many changes and it really needed some explanations. And the towns, uh, and this, this would be the third year using this kind of format, um, the feedback I received from the towns was excellent. They really appreciated um, having the level of detail and the explanation um, of both the rationale and the background and um, where we were intending to go, why we were making the de decisions we were making. So um, I, I would most likely include uh, something very similar to this, if not this. So if there are content questions or concerns that you have, Leslie, and I'd be more than happy to discuss those um, you know, offline if it's, if it's kind of a format question, um, if it's something significant and you feel that it's, it's misrepresenting the will of the board, then that is what we should be discussing now as far as the content of the memo. Uh, but it, it is my intention to send something very similar to this out with the select board packets. Uh, thank you. I want to now address the, your first question. Of why I took it, uh, you were, to, to reframe it, Leslie, just you were expressing a level of concern that with so, much, so many dynamic factors at play here, will this budget ultimately prove to be realistic or workable? Uh, my response, and I'm certainly open to correction from, from Sarah and others, is that, again, we're going to be endorsing or approving uh, a set of numbers, dollars, uh, and that's going to be the marching orders to make it work. I believe there's a process should, should things not work according to plan to such a degree that adjustments are made. I believe that there's a process that will follow. Um, but I would point out that, you know, that there is a level of discomfort, but as Sarah pointed out, there is one key variable, uh, and that is the uh, the ACR through the MRF, where she's pointed out that it is a conservative number. And if we wanted to um, discuss uh, adjusting that and direct staff to change that ACR assumption, that will certainly change the bottom line numbers as we see them. Um, we have to be careful, of course, not to just kind of fool ourselves into thinking everything's going to be rosy by raising uh, one assumption. 
but this may be something that we want to kick around here and, and get the wisdom of the full board to say, perhaps that, that assumption um, should, can and should be adjusted um, to make it a more realistic budget, which would then create some, some more breathing room should some of the cost side of, the, of this plan um, prove to be un, unworkable. Um, so I point that out. Um, but I do, um, um, Katie, your hand has been up for a while. Um, I think we'll come back to what I've just suggested, but I do want to follow um, some process here and, and respect um, board members um, who've had their hand raised. So Katie. Thanks, I forgot that I had my hand raised that long ago. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Um, on, you know, just to say, I move, I would like to make a motion to move that the FY23 budget as presented by the executive director be amended to include the 22-25 step compensation schedule as recommended by the ad hoc committee on compensation and benefits and proposed by Gallagher Flynn in their review of our compensation plan for a budget increase of $78,000. So Katie has made a formal motion to amend um, the motion that is on the table. Uh, if we have a second for this motion, then we'll go on to discuss uh, this particular uh, amendment. Uh, resolve that, and then we go back to the main motion, which is the budget. Do we have a second for Katie's motion? I'll second that. Thank you, Ken. And just to restate, the, the motion that Katie has put forward and been seconded and now be open for discussion um, is to focus on the compensation table um, that was um, reviewed and, and endorsed by the ad hoc committee uh, based on work done by Gallagher Flynn. Uh, and the projections are that would that to be a, uh, implemented in this budget, it would uh, increase the expense side of the budget by $78,000. Um, Katie, you made the motion. I don't know if you have more that you would like to say to it or open up for other commissioners, especially those on the ad hoc committee, if they'd like to talk about this. i just like to comment that I thought that, you know, it it makes sense to have this move to this schedule. I mean, when I was on staff, I didn't think it made sense that certain long-term employees hit a certain step and then couldn't go any further. I feel like this is a kind of no brainer to take care of our employees. There's really low turnover here at the district and I feel like if we're taking care of our employees that can see themselves, you know, establishing a career at CSWD and they know that they're going to be continued to be supported throughout their career. Um, you know, it's more, it's more beneficial to the district as a whole, having seasoned employees there who, you know, have been in the game for a long time means a lot to a lot of this uh, operational stuff. So I fully support that. Thank you, Katie. Ken. <clears throat> Yeah, I also wanted to say that um, that both I I I do very much appreciate um, Leslie's uh, sharp eye and and concern for you know making the right budget that is for the benefit of the district as a whole, um, and I was struck by the logic of the twenty five steps, uh, echoing what what Katie said, and. Um, I believe my understanding is that after months of review, the ad hoc committee was found consensus in supporting the Gallagher Flynn uh, recommendation. And I haven't really understood why that didn't come forward. And I would love to hear from anyone on the ad hoc committee about why they felt um, so supportive of the Gallagher Flynn uh, proposal. For the board, for the whole board. Thank you, Ken. You um, just reminded questions should be addressed to me, and then I'd open it up just um, um, so that we're not so we're yes. managing the conversation. But I, I fully appreciate uh, that request. So I'll make it on your behalf. Other other commissioners, particularly those who were participate who participate in the ad hoc uh, committee work, that would like to to make a statement. Uh, I'm hearing none at the moment. Um, I'll, uh, I, I saw your hand, Leslie, went up. Um, uh, I was going to make a comment and then I'll get to you. Um, on, in my role really as a member of the ad hoc committee, um, 
we, we hammered out a statement of philosophy that aimed to um, compensate uh, our staff um, competitively, um, uh, adequately, uh, with the aim of, of, uh, in, of attracting and retaining staff uh, and a combination of both salary and, and benefits um, and extending that table out to, to provide an incentive for a longer term employees to have some uh, more meaningful opportunity for, for, for meaningful uh, staff in salary increases. Um, as presented or as indicated already I, on page 50, I believe it's 55 of the memo of the board packet, a memo from Amy uh, regarding this, um, the, the, the new step schedule. Uh, $78,000 is the projected impact on the budget for this fiscal year. Um, she's run numbers for the subsequent three years, uh, fiscal year 24 of $100,000, fiscal year 25, an additional $135,000 and fiscal year 26, $175,000. So I think there's some information before the full board to, to gauge the impact of this um, uh, expanded um, salary schedule. Leslie. You may be muted, Leslie. You're muted. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Neither Amy's um, memo nor the findings of the ad hoc committee fully convey all the changes included in the recommended new salary schedule. And I'd like to speak to that right now. Aside from extending the number of steps from 20 to 25, which is a, um, a change that I, I would recommend and, and I find acceptable. There is a major change inside the pay structure. Right now, and this was a deliberate policy adopted, I think maybe 10 years ago, I know Alan was on the uh, finance committee at that time. So Alan, maybe you know exactly when this was happened, when this happened. But at that time, there, the finance committee felt that there was an inequity inside the yet previous pay structure, which um, had the effect of giving much larger pay increases to the highest paid employees and thereby widening the pay gap between the highest paid and the middle and lower paid employees. So back then there was a policy change that reduced the percentage increases between the steps at the highest at the, at the far end of um, seniority progression. The proposal that um, Katie and um, Ken uh, are supporting and that the ad hoc committee supported reverses that. And it includes much lower pay increases in the early steps, steps one through seven, and shifts doubles the percentage between steps for the higher, for the, the longer seniority steps. This redistributes the benefit of pay increases from the lowest low seniority employees, lowest paid lower seniority employees within any grade towards the highest paid high seniority employees. And I ran some numbers and unfortunately, I don't know how to do the screen sharing. I actually have a spreadsheet, which I, can, I will send to Sarah and Amy and anyone else who's interested. But basically I looked at grade seven and grade 14. And I looked at steps, um, uh, se step seven and step 
14. And I calculated the impact on any given, on, on uh, employees in the mid steps compared to those at the upper steps. And what you find is that the difference between the current pay structure and what is being proposed in this amendment basically shifts pay increases from the lower paid people to the higher paid people. So in, just by way of example, crude example, under the current pay structure, someone, let's say in step, in grade seven, step five or six, uh, after a 2% COLA, when they go from step seven to step eight, they would, let's say, get under the current pay structure, an additional $1,300 a year. Under the proposed pay structure, they would only get 1,000. The people at the upper end of seniority will get an additional 300. They won't lose 300. So this is a redis this proposal redistributes the benefits of future pay increases from lower paid people, lower seniority, lower paid to higher seniority, higher paid. When and if you add in a change in a 2% cost of living to maybe a 4% cost of living, that change gets magnified. And then you add it up across the entire labor force and it is not trivial. According to um, the memo that Amy provided for us this evening, between now and fiscal 26, the, cu the current proposed step schedule uh, that you're considering under this amendment will add with only a 2% COLA in it, half a million dollars to our payroll. And that's, uh, you know, and it's not clear to me whether this actually includes roll up FICA and all the mandatory. So I don't know how uh, Amy calculated this, but if there's, is there FICA in it or not, Amy? There is, it assumes However, okay. that okay. all it assumes status quo for staffing because we certainly don't know or can't project what okay. FY24, right. FY25, and FY26 are. So we made assumptions based on status quo 2% right. cost of living. Those assumptions are reasonable. Those assumptions are reasonable, but with only a 2% COLA, which I consider unrealistic right now. That's adding five hundred thousand dollars to payroll over the course over, of four budget years. That's correct. Yes, exactly, exactly. And neither Gallagher Flynn nor the ad hoc committee, when it was meeting on this, ever did any kind of forward forecasting. They never ran any numbers. You know, a consultant can come out with a great idea, but they're not doing the financial modeling for the company. Well, I'm going to that's step our in. responsibility. Uh, let's keep it uh, keep our discussion to the to the facts in front of us, and I, I want to be careful not to just. Well, I, the fact is that neither Gallagher Flynn nor the ad hoc committee did the exercise of figuring out what the impact was would be on future payroll costs, either with a 2% COLA or a 4% COLA. That's the fact. And, and, your, and, uh, and that's the reason why the Finance Committee was not comfortable with this proposal. Okay. That's, that's a good, to me, important point to hear, um, especially your explanation of that, that level of discomfort for the, uh, at the Finance Committee. Um, uh, I, I, if I could just re remind the, the, the just for a moment, very briefly, I Please. do 
support, and I think my colleagues on the Finance Committee would support extending the current pay structure up to 25 steps. That's a separate issue. And I think I appreciate you making that. I think it's important. So depending on the disposition of this um, of this motion, uh, we may bring that, I would ask you to bring that back up for, for further discussion, but let's not get into that at this point in time, um, unless other commissioners would like to know more about it. But um, I wanna give Amy a chance to, um, to, to weigh in here and, and uh, offer a uh, response and perspective. Thank you. So yes, there. I just wanted to clarify, and I know some people have heard this multiple times, so I apologize, but our pay grade and step schedule changed in 2013. We did have from 2006 to 2013, a 30-step schedule with 1.25% between steps. In 2013, because we do this study every few years, that changed and grades one or steps one through six are 2.25%, steps seven through 19 are 1.4% and step 20 is 1%. And the range between the, the grades is a 35% salary range or 40% salary range if it's higher. Um, so that was changed in 2013. This proposal, when we went out to the consultant, came back with trying to accomplish several things. One of those was, in, um, as they identified, encouraging employee motivation and feeling of mobility for employees so that they did have, we talked about the career length of 20 years versus 25, which I appreciate Leslie just pointed out. She felt the finance committee was in favor of it really just establishes a longer runway for our employees um, and keeps employees in the competitive range as identified by Gallagher Flynn. So one of the conversations that the ad hoc committee had was it's not recognizing tenure, our current step schedule. So employees are receiving that higher step and then it's declining over time and they tasked Gallagher Flynn with looking at another way to do that. So the proposal changes that to include steps at 2%, 2.15% and 2.2% so that the it's, it's recognizing tenure. And I just wanted to speak to the COLA piece. The finance committee um, probably 20 plus years ago approved so that we had consistency within our plan using the Northeast Urban CPI Class BC. Um, so we've used that for the past two decades in our pay structure, with the exception of a year where it was a negative number and we didn't take away. And there was a high year where I think it was 5% and we it was like four, three point something. Um, Historically, it's been low. I know that's changing, as Leslie pointed out. In FY15, it was under a percentage. In FY17, it was zero. FY18, it was under 1%. We know that that's likely to not be the case in future years, but it's not a guaranteed 2%. The current structure that we have is to look at the Northeast Urban CPI and see if that's reasonable number to use. And then the finance committee sees that every year when they do the roll up. So I just wanted to point out those um, couple of, of additional pieces. Thank you. Uh, Nola, your hand was up. I just wanted to clarify some math. I actually have um, our current employee roster with the various step schedules, the 20 versus the 25. There happens to be an employee who's at grade seven, step seven, and the trans the difference between moving from seven to eight in the twenty step schedule is seventeen eighty five. The difference in the twenty five step schedule is two thousand seventy eight. So they're actually making about three hundred dollars more. Thank you, Nola. Other questions and comments from the commissioners, observations on this proposed amendment to the, to the budget. I do, uh, I do have one other quick comment. Uh, the total compensation philosophy does outline that we will review this um, 
and the wording is at a regular cadence so that we typically it's been five to seven years that it's reviewed. Gallagher Flynn's recommendation was three to five. So, um, you know, there is that backstop to, to review that. And certainly if um, inflation continues the way it is, we may be directed uh, by Sarah to look at that before the, the three to five years because cost would be a concern. But um, if the 25 step schedule is implemented, um, it, it doesn't mean that it's, you know, for a long period of time, it could be reviewed sooner. Thank you, Amy. Um, Bryn, your hand was up. Did it come back? I in? saw that Alan was trying to talk and was looking to get your attention for that. So he's oh, got his hand up now. Thank you. I missed you, Alan. Sorry. Go ahead. You're muted. Alan, you're muted. Um, having spent 18 years as a select board member looking at these budgets from the municipal organizations that, that don't fall under the purview of local government. Um, one of the things that uh, the board always, you know, looked at is how the salaries compared in those organizations versus what we were doing in the town. And I just want to remind the board that in November, we're going to be going out and asking um, the voters of Chittenden County for a, a significant bond issue. And I think that when the ad hoc committee was working on this, um, you know, part of our thought process, or at least mine was to uh, make the district look as positive as it could to two folks uh, out there. And I think, you know, waiting a year to implement the, the new pay schedule is a smart thing to do, but that's just one voice in the wilderness. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Bryn, did you want to make a comment? Uh, I'm not... Sure. Um... I mean, I sat on the ad hoc committee and um, was one of uh, one of the group that did support the 25 set schedule. Um, I do think that there is benefit to um, uh, compensating for tenure. Um, and I also think that the committee um, did not have the chance to look at the multi-year, year-over-year forecasting. Um, and that was something that the committee said, you know, we're going to leave that to the finance committee to look at, um, you know, just to say like, okay, this is what um, in concept the ad hoc committee is comfortable with. Let's leave it to the finance committee to look at the numbers. Um, and so that is what the finance committee has done. Um, I think my concern is not, um, is not, it, it, it's not quite the same as, um, as Leslie's, um, but I, I do agree that I have some concerns. I mainly, um, knowing that, um, the challenges that we will face with our capital budgets, um, staying, uh, on uh, within forecast with supply chain challenges, with um, inflation, um, with other anticipated um, uh, contract increases that my greatest concern is that we don't increase um, user fees significantly for our residents and for our businesses um, when they also are, are facing um, financial hard, and anticipated financial um, challenges and hardships. Um, you know, we're not, we will have some support to reduce the capital expenses um, as much as we can. I have confidence that Sarah and the team will look for um, grants and, and other funding sources to offset that cost. Um, but I, I think that's, one, those are one or two projects in the long line of capital projects that we know are um, anticipated. So 
I think I come at it from from the angle of like, yes, I do support um, a 25 ske schedule and I want to make sure that we're being um, fiscally judicious so that we're not we're we're not looking at just FY23, but we are looking at year over year. So I think in that regard, I would support Alan's um, recommendation to at least postpone for one year until after bonding um, and give a chance for um, finance committee to just assess what the what that full picture is um, with the goal of saying like yes the the philosophy of the ad hoc committee is to compensate our um, our employees and our um, long tenured employees so um, I'm not usually a fan of um, postponing big decisions but I I, I would support Alan's um, recommendation in this regard. Thanks, Bryn. Um, other comments related to this motion to amend the budget? I think then we're up, oh, Tim. Uh, you may be. Just more, more of a process question. I, it, this is an interesting issue. Is it, is it appropriate that former CSWD employees are casting a vote about compensation of current CSWD employees? I'm not answering the question, I'm just weighing in. Yeah, from a process standpoint, um, Katie is, does not have a conflict of interest because she is, is not a current employee. Um, and I think because, oh gosh, Katie, you may need to remind me, but um, I think you struck out on your own in 2017. It was um, 2017, correct, five years yeah. ago. Yeah, so there's there's been some space. Um, and, you know, again, Westford was fully aware um, that Katie was a former employee when they uh, appointed her as their representative. So uh, I believe the town has, has confidence in her ability to cast those appropriately. I, I would concur with Sarah's assessment, uh, or uh, and I also believe um, in reading a conflict of interest policy. This may be too not the line may not be that fine, but that uh, uh, commissioners or or individuals may vote in favor of something that that would generally benefit them indirectly, but but not necessarily specifically. So that uh, somebody might be able to vote for a uh, a reduction in property taxes, even though it benefits them directly. Um, but it's done, um, but the, the benefit uh, is spread much more far and wide. Um, but I think uh, my, my opinion is that uh, Katie would be entirely appropriate for her to vote on this. And if it's, if it's more of a concern, I guess we can ask Thomas to weigh in at this point. But I, I'm not certain we need to take the time to, to do that, Tim. As I said, I just posed the question. I don't know the answer. Okay. Uh, I think we've, we've addressed that then. Other comments on this motion to amend the budget? I believe we're ready for the question. I believe this will not be a unanimous vote. So I would last ask all the commissioners who are currently um, have turned off their video to turn on their video and we will take the vote by a raise of hands so that the secretary, Amy, can, can record them and, and uh, quickly add up um, the tally of votes to determine whether the motion passes or fails. So again, the motion is to amend the budget um, to implement the uh, step schedule that was reviewed and endorsed by the ad hoc committee, which was originally uh, developed by the Gallagher-Flynn study. Uh, a vote in favor of this motion would, would insert or would, would change the budget to using that table and would uh, increase the expense side of the budget by $78,000. Leslie, do you have a procedural question? Yes. Um, you know, uh, last, um, last meeting, we went to a roll call vote um, simply because to me, trying to count hands, if you miss somebody who doesn't show up on your screen, no matter how they're voting, it, to me, the, 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 the opportunity for error is, is not insignificant on a Zoom meeting. 
if you know it's not going to be unanimous, why not do it by roll call just for uh, the sake of accuracy and fairness? Thank so you. Somebody uh, yeah. who's, you know. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Paul, oh, is this a weighted vote or a one down, one vote? It's a weighted vote. This is a Thank you. So Amy, when you're ready. Yep. Uh, uh, Bur Burlington? No. Um, Charlotte? Ken. You're muted, Ken. Ken, you're muted. Sorry, yes. Uh, Colchester? Liz, you were vote you you were muted, I believe, when you voted. I'm sorry. I uh no. Um Essex. No. Uh, and Essex Town, Essex Junction. No. Uh, Heinsberg. No. And Huntington is not here tonight. Jericho. No. Uh, Milton, I do not see. Richmond, I do not see. Shelburne. I apologize, my battery died. What am I, what, <laughs> what's my note? Uh, the amendment for the 78,000 to go to the 25 step schedule. No. Uh, South Burlington is not here tonight. St. George is not here tonight. Underhill? Yes. And Westford? Yes. Williston? No. And Winooski. No. Uh, motion does not pass. Thank you, Amy. So as she said, the motion has failed uh, to amend the budget. We are now back to the main motion, which is the budget as presented. Um, further discussion? Um, I would invite Leslie at this point. Yes, your hand is up, please, Leslie. Yeah, I'd like to move an amendment um, to add five steps uh, to all the current pay grades at the same percentage between steps as exists between step 19 and 20. Which would so be if you're which would be a one percent step. Right. Yeah. That's your, your, that's clear to you, Leslie, your motion? Yes. Thank you. Is there a second to Leslie's motion? Second. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we'll now open discussion on this proposed amendment to the budget, which um, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure I can clearly, clearly state it. Um, so um, if either you, Leslie, or perhaps Amy, somebody could just explain for the full board the ramifications of what this proposal is. Sure. So we have six folks that are at the end of a 20 step schedule. So they were they are currently in the budget as presented as a half a percent lump sum increase based on a successful evaluation. If this uh, passes, it would be twenty seven hundred dollar twenty seven thirty eight. So two thousand seven hundred and thirty eight dollar change essentially for those six employees because we're adding a half of another half of a percentage um, availability for those for just F, so just for FY23 costs. Thank you. Um, Tim, your hand was up. It came down. You're good. Leslie. Yeah, I just like to point out that even though uh, it seems like a small increase for this year, it does put people at a platform. In other words, in the next year, they're gonna be starting at a higher level than they otherwise would if we did not uh, make this change to the step schedule. Um, because when you get a lump sum, 
it's just like a, a bonus, a one-time check. It's not wrapped into your um, salary status. So this just literally puts, it lengthens the ladder. It's not a one-time bonus payment. So it is a little bit different, even though it seems like a small change. Over time, it will have a bigger effect. Thanks, Leslie. Tim. I just I just wanted to confirm. I, I think I, I did the math and I wanted to confirm with Noel that I didn't get it wrong. But so if the ACR that in the proposed budget is um, the assumption is eighty dollars a ton. Uh, Tim, I want to we're 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 focused on on Leslie's amendment here on the salary schedule. Um, I, I don't want to in, introduce the ACR question at this point. Okay, so we're going to come back to the total budget then. Oh, yes, definitely. But right now we can only put, deal with the proposed amendment um, dealing with the step schedule. But other comments and questions relating to Leslie's motion to amend the budget? I believe then we are ready for the question, um, which uh, just for clarity's sake, uh, Amy, can you... Um, restate what the motion is do you have it i do not i didn't write it down but i it's to <laughs> it's I, I wrote to it down. change the current of uh, go ahead. Down. Um, to amend the budget as presented to add five steps to all pay grades at the same percentage as the current 19 to the current percentage between steps 19 and 20. So it, should, it actually should say amend to add five steps to the end of the pay grade schedule. At, at 1%. At 1%. And Leslie, that, uh, that clarification is, um, is acceptable to you? That's fine, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I trust uh, any board members who are unclear as to what we're voting on, which again is to amend the budget to extend the current uh, salary schedule. Uh, I, I, my Liz, sense I'm Liz, sorry. Yeah, I, I just have, I just have a question. Are we, is this for just this year's budget? And then uh, are we, so this is just an addition for the five, five steps for this particular year's budget? Or is this staying in perpetuity, perpet, you know, for forever? Or I guess I'm just trying to understand, is this a stopgap or is this in stone? for just this year or for how long? What precedent are we setting? Sure, each budget is is reviewed annually, so it can be changed in any way every year. So it does not have to be in perpetuity. But we're looking at adding five steps to the pay grade scale. And unless it's addressed as an individual item next year, it's gonna stay in perpetuity. That is correct. Katie. So um, what does that mean exactly for the tenured employees that are maybe coming close to this year? Or is, it, is there a possibility for them that are close to the, that step to get, you know, be able to get their increase? How many people does this impact if we don't do this this year? If we don't, if we don't include the 25 step schedule this year? If we, I'm sorry, if we don't, if we do not do the 22 to 25 step, we just do what Leslie's motion was, just to include the. Yeah, so right now we've had multiple people that have been at step 20 and have not received the uh, more than the half of percent lump sum. So what this provides to them, those six employees is the ability to move out on the step schedule based on a successful evaluation to step 21. And then if it were to stay, as Alan pointed out, and nothing changes in the next couple of years, those people that are on 18 and 19 that would have hit that end of salary range have that same ability to go out the 1%. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Other questions pertaining to this motion, which is to amend the budget? Lee? Yeah. Yeah, I may have missed it. Um, what was the total impact going to be with this addition on the budget for FY23? 
$2,738 is the estimate. It might be off by a couple of dollars with retirement affected at 6%, but it's that's the quick estimate. That's what I thought I heard. Thank you. That's a good question for clarity on what, what, uh, what you'll be voting on. Other questions? My sense is we're ready for the question. My sense is also that we are able to, we will be able to do this by voice vote. If it's, the results are unclear, then we can go to a roll call vote. But I'll call for a voice vote on this. All those commissioners in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? The motion carries. The budget has been amended. We're back now to the main motion, which is the budget as, as now amended. Uh, Tim, I'd like to turn it over to you. You were have started to ask a question about the ACR. Yeah, I, I just wanted to confirm that uh, what, if the assumption in the budget is $80, Per ton for the ACR, and we're currently at 135. What's a full year impact if we stay at 135? I think it's I think it's two million dollars, but I just wanted to confirm that I'm not doing my math wrong. That would be like a 55 dollar per ton difference times the number of marketed tons, which I think made Josh was 38 thousand, and then divided by two. Somebody got a calculator there to quick run it. So it's a so is it a million dollar impact? So can you just repeat one more time, Tim, what, what you had indicated now? I might if, be able to if if the ACR we budgeted at 80, how much more cash do we generate if it stays at 135 for full it's a million. Million. million dollars? Okay. Thank you. Is there any interest or discussion on the board to um, direct a change in that ACR assumption, which is currently $80? I, I think that what's implicit in Tim's question is that um, should um, the ACR stay on the high side, there, there is potential um, good news on this budget. Leslie. I would only say that it's good news on the revenue side, but the same forces that are pushing up that ACR will push up all the other costs. You know, they'll push up our fuel costs, they'll push up the costs of uh, when we go to bid for some of this equipment. Um, so uh, I feel that it would be prudent to leave the ACR where it is because <clears throat> we're, we're gonna have my sense is from everything I'm reading in um, economic forecasting, um, there could be some ugly surprises when we have to go out to bid for some of these capital costs we're anticipating, some of this equipment, some of this consulting. Um, everything's a little haywire and the uncertainty level is unpre at unprecedented heights. So, I think we have to be very cautious and very prudent. Um, Paul, just also to clarify, um, Leslie brings up a good point on uh, capital projects and, and purchases. Josh is budgeting a higher than normal contingency for each project and, and purchase just because of those reasons. So normally we would we would budget about a 10 to 12 percent contingency, and in some cases we're we're budgeting 20 to 25 percent because we simply don't know. Um, so we are keeping a very close eye on, May, on that. I have some real estate update. Abby, did you have a, a comment? Um, moving on, I think we have addressed the ACR question uh, in this budget. Other discussion on the budget, any elements in the budget that uh, board members would like to, uh, to address? I am seeing none, uh, I'd say then we are, I think, getting ready to um, 
address the question as to whether or not we will, the board will, will vote to approve this uh, amended budget. Again, I think we're ready for the question. Uh, we'll do a voice vote. If the result is unclear, then we can go to a roll call vote. But all those in favor of approving the budget as amended for the fiscal year 2023, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I declare the budget as amended to be approved. And now Sarah has a lot of work to do in the next several weeks, many meetings. I also point out that it is very good if uh, when the schedule comes out, if commissioners can, can join Sarah at the meetings uh, in, in your specific towns. And Amy will send out the, um, the schedule. We are still waiting for a few towns to confirm, um, but we do have the next week's schedule set. So Amy can send that out to everyone. Um, who's affected. And yes, I would love to see you there. And I can assure you, Sarah will do most of the talking and the heavy lifting. So uh, not to worry, you don't have to be an ex expert on the budget. Next item on the agenda is item five, the Redmond Road water line expansion, expansion ODF phase two expansion. Uh, I will turn this over, I presume to Josh or perhaps Sarah. Uh, Josh, yes, please. We're on page 62 of your board packet. Correct. So uh, the first part uh, is the municipal water line extension. So we brought this to the board about two or three different times. We've had um, a consulting wor consultant working with us the entire time. The plan is to extend municipal water from roughly where the Global Foundries entry is off of Redmond Road down to the compost facility. Um, this is a multi-layered project because it will provide services to uh, our proposed admin building and our proposed MRF. Um, but currently the, the compost facility um, has had a, a, a problem with um, a water source um, over the last couple of years because we've got a lagoon um, that we pull water from for process purposes. But the lagoon's full when it's raining, we aren't necessarily that dry. We don't really require that much water during our processes. When it gets hot, our lagoon's pretty much empty. Um, so that, that actually requires us to truck water from that fire hydrant that I told you about that was uh, at the Global Foundries entrance down to our compost facility, which is roughly, I think I wrote in there, 10 times more expensive um, to do that. So uh, back in FY21, we kind of asked permission to kind of investigate this. Um, it's come to full fruition. We've got a full set of design plans and we've gone out to bid. Um, our initial engineer's estimate had us upwards of $800,000. Thank goodness. Um, there's some hungry, hungry contractors out there. Um, it did come in about $466,000. Um, we had budgeted $400,000, um, but that budget was prior to cost increases for materials. Um, four sixty-six, I'm relatively happy with, but as Sarah indicated, we also added a 20% contingency in the event any materials increase um, or we run into any complications. I don't anticipate complications, but the 20% is really just reflective of the environment that we're in right now during construction. So that's kind of the overview. Um, we did go out to bid with three different, um, we actually went to about 12 different local um, contractors. We got three back. Um, I've contacted all three um, and I followed up with the Ormond Bushy and Sons and their, their, their bid's accurate. Um, they just were looking to get some work. Um, They're uh, a well-established and very good construction crew. I vetted all their um, references and spoke with the town about it as well. So I, I, do, I do think uh, and feel that their, their services will be exemplary. Thanks for your, your overview, uh, Josh. Let's uh, again follow our, our practice of having a motion and then putting it on the floor for discussion. Um, can the motion be read, please? So I can read the, the motion. Be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners of the Chittenden Solid Waste District hereby authorizes the Executive Director to enter into a contractual agreement with Ormond, Bushy, and Sons of Essex Junction, Vermont, in a total amount not to exceed $583,000 for the purpose of extending municipal water down Redmond Road to the ODF in the town of Wilson, Vermont. 
Thank I'll you. Move yes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Essex moved second. Did I miss it already? Who seconded? Burlington. Thank you. We're now open for discussion and questions on the motion. Uh, I'll start out. I have a question. I think it's already been reviewed, but where does the money come from? The, the capital budget. Thank you. Thank you. And there's money in the capital accounts Correct. to pay for this. Yes. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out is that we are, you know, actually, I apologize. I said a 20% contingency. I actually put a 25% contingency because ductile iron is the requirement by the town of Williston. Um, so we are on a, uh, a significant lead time. I think it's about five weeks. Um, and with the volatility of metal right now, that's why I bumped up at 25%. But the difference uh, in the contingency is about $116,000. We had in our capital budget included roughly, strangely enough, $116,000 to upgrade Richmond. Um, but we no longer run Richmond. So um, that's why I felt comfortable putting that 25% contingency on this and not exceeding our capital budget, um, our approved capital budget total for FY22. Thank you. Other discussion from the board? Bryn. Um, it may be per, uh, preemptive to ask, do we have any sense for what cost estimates might be for the extensions for the admin building and for the MRF? This actually includes an extension up that Velco Road um, to service our admin building. So um, there will be a requirement to feed. We're going about 250 feet up that Velco Road. Um, once we're out of the city's right of way, we can use PVC, which is about a third of the cost. Yeah. So that'll help manage that that price to actually hook up to the to both the admin and the uh, and the MRF. And we spoke with uh, the Williston Fire Department and. They had significant concerns if we didn't connect water to the MRF for fire um, suppression concern, uh, reasons. So that's why we just decided to bring it all the way up at this point. And I see that you, um, the memo includes estimates for um, the water rates from Williston. Maybe. Um, yes. Yeah, so we have, well, when I included the water rates for Williston, I just you know approximated the, the cost between the trucking of water and municipal services. Um, has there been any indication from Williston that those uh, rates will be increasing in FY23 or beyond? No, not that I can tell. And we we've actually, we reached out and contacted uh, the Champlain Water District as well, just to check. And it doesn't look like there's any volatility in that other than like a, a standard rate increase, but nothing significant due to the current climate we're seeing, <laughs> dynamics we're seeing. Cool. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners? I think then we're ready for the question. All those in favor of the motion uh, as read by Sarah, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Abstentions. Motion passes. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, Great. And staff. Uh, we're now at the point of our, our agenda for a five minute break. We're running a little bit uh, ahead of schedule, which is welcome. Um, I have it at 739 right now. Let's reconvene at 745. Thank you. I, I, video is off for many commissioners, but I'm going to trust that you're actually back uh, in the saddle here. Um, you know, we're maintaining our quorum. Um, I missed, uh, when we entered the break, I overlooked the fact that there was actually two parts of item number five on the agenda. The second part being the ODF phase two expansion. Um, Sarah had earlier today sent out the document, two documents that were not part of that package um, in case you didn't have a chance to review them. 
Um, we're going to pick this item up now, and Sarah, if you could put them up on the screen, we will. Oh, yes, I will. And they um, they were sent out on Friday, so they came okay. out kind of immediately after the packets. But I do apologize that they were inadvertently um, left out of the packets. So you did have those right. um, um, two days ago. But I'll bring up the memo just in case. And then Josh, let me know if you want the map um, shown as well. I think we'll, we'll if we show the map at the end of the discussion, I think would be would be great just so people know what I'm talking about. Yep, just let me know. Okay. Everybody's ready for me to go. I can I can jump right into it. Oh, right ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, the second part of this, which is why I looked so confused five minutes ago, um, is uh, is our organics diversion facility. It's our phase two expansion. So if you guys remember um, about a year and a half ago, we had expanded our footprint in our uh, windrow and curing area and our business sales area that was to increase site efficiency that was also to increase site safety um, so this next phase um, is to really address the front end of the uh, operation so that's the approach to get into the facility um, and really it kind of it revolved around the the, the scale itself that we use on site um, the existing scale uh, is is quite old um, I don't know if I referenced it in here and how old it is, but it is on its last legs. We do need to purchase one. We were approved to purchase one, but along and we we pushed that early on because there were um, material lead issues uh, on that. So we purchased it back in oh, I'd say November, um, and I think it's going to be ready to be delivered here in the next month. So um, this is the next step of that, and what we're planning on doing is we would like to fit up the existing 860 residents to become the new ODF uh, um, administrative office. Um, and that will be built in right next to the scale. We're going to increase our approach so that we can accommodate more traffic through uh, and more efficiently. And then this approach will also separate the residential kind of leaf yard and woody drop off um, away from the commercial drop off of food scraps. So this is kind of like the final major capital investment we're performing with this site. Um, so that's kind of the basics. We, we again went out, um, we broke it into two different um, bids. The first bid was to prep the site for putting the scale in and fitting up the new administrative office for the ODF in the existing 860 residence, uh, which is what you see right here. Um, we went out to multiple local contractors. We got four back. Farrington Construction was the lowest uh, upon awarding bid. We did multiple site visits. Um, we're adding on uh, redoing the roof of the existing garage because it got hit by a tree. Um, and then we're also adding on some long-term efficiencies. We're going to redo the windows um, in the existing 860 house. So with that, we actually brought that um, Farrington construction cost up to $225,000. Um, and what we added on was a relative apples to apples comparison on what everybody else would have done. And again, as Sarah had mentioned, I'm adding a 25% contingency onto that $225,000. And really that's because we're opening up an old house, uh, we're performing construction. Uh, right now, a lot of materials are hard to get. Um, but we have we do have a good pretty good working relationship with Farrington construction they've been their communication has been wonderful. So we do feel that we're in a pretty good place to not exceed the $225,000 unless something comes up. So that is the first portion of this memo. Uh, the second portion is the site expansion, the approach itself it's to we're going to use an existing Jeep trail off of Redmond Road that we have. Um, it'll increase the line of sight into the facility, so it's a safer approach into the facility. Um, and then we're going to uh, install a 30-foot wide road all the way into uh, the materials drop-off areas, and, and we'll see the site map here in a second. We went out to 12 local contractors on this one. We saw three come back. Um, all three are very, very good um, construction companies, we're going to go with Orman Bushies and Sons on this one as well. Um, we had them out multiple times and they are very aware of the scope. Um, again, I'm adding a 20% contingency to this, um, which brings the project to roughly $400,500. So that's 
So that's kind of the, the basics, uh, basic overview of this, this project. And uh, Sarah, if you want to bring up the map, I can kind of give people a, an idea of, of what we've got going on. So we're, all right, that's great. So with the uh, increased improvements, I, I, didn't, I didn't show us coming off of Redmond Road and coming into the site, but that gray area, that's that 30 foot wide road. Um, we're installing a 70 foot long, 11 foot wide scale. It's a little oversized to meet all, all trucking requirements. Um, we're gonna build out a scale house um, so that we can have the option of having an attendant there if needed, um, but the scale will most likely be unattended so that we can allow the person who would be in the scale house to operate the scale house half time and also be uh, beyond contamination control, which is a new, um, which is new to the ODF, which is also very, very much needed at this point. Um, the lagoon I was talking about and the water line project is, is right there, that big body of water. We will be removing that. We'll take out the liner. Um, all the cut and all the fill that we will perform in this construction project won't require us to bring any material on site. So what we cut to, to bring the road in will fill in the pond, which works out well. And then this will go hand in hand with the lot water line extension, because you can see that W, that blue W line, that's bringing water into the site. Um, but that's what the, the approach looks like. Um, what we're also doing, if you look at the yard, you can see kind of a black outline. Um, we're expanding our receiving area and we're going to start taking uh, wood uh, at the site as well, which we haven't historically taken. Um, we typically aggregate everything down to the Wilson drop-off center, grind it there, and then bring it up to the ODF site. So to just find efficiencies and not have to truck it more than once or handle it more than once, we'll just collect it all here. Um, we'll grind it here and we'll use it here. So it's an efficiency of an input as well as aggregating at the site that uses the actual uh, uh, wood chips. Um, again, as I had said, the larger trucks will go up and around the yard and all the way around. This works there. Um, and then they will go and they will dump at our tip floor. And that keeps them separate from all the residential and other traffic that brings in leaf yard and wood. Because those people will go into the actual yard itself, dump their materials, and then exit at a four-way stop on the way out. We do have this as a one-way approach but we are designing the road to be 30 feet in width so that we can, if we wanna make that change to two-way, um, we can do that as well. And that was one of the questions that the Williston DRB had for us. So that's, that's basically the project. Thank you, Josh. Um, Sarah, can you read off the motions and then we'll open it up for discussion. Paul, do you want to take the motions one by one? Um, yeah, let's do that. Procedurally? Sure. Okay. So the, the first motion reads, be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners of the Chittenden Solid Waste District hereby authorizes the Executive Director to enter into con contractual agreement with Farrington Construction located in Shelburne, Vermont, for a total not to exceed $270,000. The purpose of and I should say retrofitting the 860 Redmond Road office, scale house and garage modifications in the town of Williston, Vermont. Are the commissioner willing to move this motion? Essex moves it. Thank you, Alan, a second? Second, Jericho. Thank you, Leslie. Discussion from the board on this, this motion. I'll ask the question again, where does the money come from? It comes from our capital budget. And um, we did budget conservatively when we, when we did this in 2021. So with the 20% contingencies, we anticipate being at or under our budgeted amount for this project, for this capital project. Thank you. Additional questions? I believe then we're ready for the question. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Are there any abstentions? The motion carries. Sarah, could you read the second motion? 
Chairman. Be it further resolved that the Board of Commissioners of the Chittenden Solid Waste District hereby authorizes the Executive Director to enter into contractual agreement with Ormond Bushy and Sons located in Essex Junction, Vermont, for total not to exceed $400,500 for the purpose of constructing a new approach road component of the phase two expansion of the ODF in the town of Williston, Vermont. Thank you. Someone to move this? Essex. Second, you, Jericho. Thank you, Leslie. Questions or discussion from the board? Tim. Tim? Josh, what's the payback? Is it a one year payback or a 20 year payback? You talk about um, efficiencies. That is a great question. It is probably a 10 to 15 year payback, to be totally honest. But um, this allows us to not have to significantly invest to increase the amount of, of food scraps we take on site. So right now, as Sarah had indicated, our sweet spot is between five and 6,000 tons. If you remember two years ago, our sweet spot was 5,000 tons because of the efficiencies we've seen in our current capital investments, we can push that. With this, we can do a minimal capital investment and I would say hit 8,000 tons if we need to. Um, so in, in that scenario, as more food comes in, it gives us the ability to exceed, increase our capacity. It puts us in position for that. Um, so that's why I say you know 10 to 15 years, it depends on how much more food uh, source separated organics come in. Thank you. I, I just want to go on record. I think it's appropriate that we see some type of a consistent, uh, you know, return calculation on capital okay. that's going forward. Other commissioners? Lee. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this kind of question about the contractor, is this project going to what, what's the timeline with this project compared to the water line uh, installation? It's a great question. They go hand in hand because we can't remove the pond until we get the water line in. So um, we have to wait for that lead time. There is some flexibility in the contractor that we could build the road around the pond and pause and wait for the ductile iron to come in. So that's really once we get approval, I'm going to sit down and negotiate um, what kind of time frame we're looking at. Ultimately, if ductile iron meets its existing lead time, this full project of water line and ODF expansion will probably be done end of September, early October. If we can be creative, we could probably get this expansion project done probably middle of July um, and then wait for the ductile to come in. Mormon, big enough, still they hand, handle this yeah. type of project? Yeah, we had, we had a long talk on Friday about, uh, about that timeline and that time frame. And they said, yes, they're, they're more than willing to be flexible with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question on process after we vote on this ball. After the vote? Yeah. So Josh, I'll ask, oh, go ahead, Bryn. Did you get their flexibility in writing? That's gonna be part of the, I was waiting for approval from the board before I do that. Um, and that's okay. gonna be part of the contract. We haven't written up a contract yet. Okay. But that will absolutely be in the contract. Great. So I'll ask the, for the third time tonight the, the, the question of where's the money coming from, but also how did it compare to budget? Same, same thing. Um, coming from the capital budget with 20% contingency, we will meet or be slightly under our budget amount. Other discussion on this motion? I'm seeing none. I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say no. That doesn't count. <laughs> uh, and abstentions. Uh, motion carries. Thank you, Thank John. you, everybody. No, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, board, for supporting this. Alan, you had a question about process? Yeah, I mean, I only spent 30 years putting out government contracts and I've never, never publicly 
made a statement as to what the contingency was for the job. Whereas, you know, I mean, all that the contractor has to do is to come to this meeting and see that, uh, you know, the board gave you approval up to, you know, X number of dollars. And, uh, you know, so when I put my first change order in, it goes, you know, 50% of that way. And then the next change order is another 25%. I just, that making it public like that, uh, you know, where the contractor has a leg up on us, I just don't know that that's a good process, but I leave that to, to you guys to work. It's an interesting question. And again, we, we are clear with our contractors that when they bid a project um, and consultants, any, anyone who bids us a project, their response is becomes part of the contract. And so <clears throat> we do discuss um, you know, ahead of time often the need for contingency and, and they'll often bring them up, right? You know, particularly in this time of, of, of our history where um, everyone is telling us, this is what I can bid you now. Your best bet is to add 10% just in case. And, you know, our guys do a great job at holding um, our contractors to their initial response. I do think that it's important though for the board to, um, to know the potential full cost of the project so that I'm not coming back to you um, with you know, requests to add more money, like we had to you know, with, with the truck. Um, that one was ordered so long ago and it's taken so long to come in that uh, we thought we had built in enough contingency and it just you know, wasn't the case. So I hear you, Alan, in that, you know, when we're, it, it would certainly be different if we were to put out an RFP and saying, this is our budget. We don't do that. We don't include that amount um, in our RFPs. And we've also been dinged a little bit uh, by some folks who chose not to respond because they said, well, how do I know what your budget is? It's like, well, number one, you can look in our document. Um, but we also want to get what you feel vendor, potential vendor, is the actual price. Um, and then we can make the decision um, internally. And if we need to come back to the board, we come back to the board to say, this, like we did again with the water line, this isn't what we had estimated. This isn't what we anticipated. So I do hear you um, in that respect that we don't want to, you know, kind of give that, that, um, that almost look like a blank check. It certainly is not. And if we take change orders very seriously. We don't see many of them. Um, and we have very good project management. So. I know Josh is going to, he knows this already, but he is tasked with holding them to the bid price and then having them justify the new changes um, in writing it to Brent's, Brent's point as well. No, no, I just hadn't seen it before too much. So I just thought- Yeah, I no, and I, pre I appreciate the question and, and it gives me the opportunity to kind of explain a little bit of our thought process behind why yeah. I would think it this way. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for bringing it up, Alan. Yeah. Uh, we are now ready to move on to item number six on the agenda, uh, the household waste survey report, which was a holdover from our March meeting. Um, thank you, uh, Nancy, for waiting this extra month um, to make your, your presentation. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, um, I just have a notice that the host disabled participant screen sharing. Amy? Stand by. And while we're waiting for that, I'll just offer my observation that this is part of a, it's I would characterize it kind of a longitudinal study. We This has been done for many, many years and it's important to kind of frame, I think what this district is all about. Um, so it's it's a lot of good information that we need to to internalize and understand. Nancy, can you share now? Yeah, there you go. I can. Thank you, Amy. Good evening, everyone. I have a lot of good news to share with you um, from the survey. First, though, I'd like to talk about the purpose of the survey, the type of survey conducted, and the sample of households. Uh, then I'll review the results and comparisons to previous surveys. And at the end, I'll provide some conclusions and recommendations. 
The survey's objectives are to quantify households' waste management and waste reduction activities, measure the public's perception and knowledge of the current system, and to gauge public opinion on various solid waste initiatives. The results of the survey help guide future facility program and policy decisions. We've been conducting household surveys roughly every two years, uh, with the last one conducted in 2019. We contracted with the firm Partners and Brainstorms to conduct the 2021 survey. They used a hybrid telephone and online model. Our previous household surveys were completed through telephone interviews only. We made the change for two main reasons. One, we hope to reduce the social desirability bias that can occur in surveys. Uh, recent research has shown that respondents typically are more truthful when answering questions about their beliefs or their behaviors in online surveys versus with a live person on the phone. Number two, we also wanted to increase participation by younger residents and renters who have often been underrepresented in our telephone surveys. In our survey, respondents chose whether to complete the survey online or on the phone, it was their choice. 88% completed it online. Please note that reading potential responses online may have prompted fuller or different responses by residents to certain types of questions compared to how they may have responded in a telephone survey where possible responses were not provided. This and the expected reduction in the social desirability bias may explain at least in part some of the major differences between the results from the 2021 and past surveys. Our sample included 507 residents. There's an estimated plus or minus 4.4% margin of error. The research firm looked for statistically significant relationships between demographic variables and responses to questions, and I will be highlighting some of those. Due to the small numbers of respondents in our smaller communities, municipalities were grouped regionally when they looked for geographical differences. Now onto the results. On this slide, you can see the public's impression of CSWD continues uh, to be positive. Only 1% have a negative impression. This chart shows how responses to this question have changed over time. The dip in 2006 may have been due to very vocal opposition to the district's planning of a landfill. This discussion died as a decision on a landfill was postponed to focus on increased diversion. The additional boost in 2013 may have been a result of a positive response to our handling of the persistent herbicides problem. Since then, we have had a heightened digital presence, which may have bumped this up further. Suggestions for improving trash and recycling services in Chittenden County were all over the board, but some repeated comments include increased education on what's recyclable, how to prepare recyclables, what are the benefits of diversion, what happens to our waste and recyclables, and how are we doing? Suggestions also included increased emphasis on reuse and waste reduction, increased availability of recycling containers in public areas, consolidate curbside collection, use the latest technology, expand hours at drop-off centers, increase school outreach, provide incentives, and the most common response was that no changes were needed. Regarding cons uh, consolidated collection of trash and recyclables, we saw a huge jump in support as compared to 2019. The increase may be related to the different survey format with most respondents reading versus hearing this rather lengthy question. And, and or it may be related to the fact that the topic has been in the news for a few years as the cities of Burlington and South Burlington consider implementing this type of system. The strongest levels of support were reported by individuals residing in Region 1, which includes Burlington, South Burlington, and Winooski, with 75% choosing strongly support or support, and by individuals who have lived in Chittenden County longer than five years. 
this chart shows how responses to this question have changed over time. Similar to previous survey results, there is stronger support for consolidated collection system for just household food scraps. As with support for trash and recycling collection, there was a large jump in support to 92% in this case. The increase may be due to the reasons just stated and or because of the food scrap ban that went into effect in 2020. The strongest levels of support were reported by individuals residing in Region 5, which includes Bolton, Jericho, Underhill, and Westford, with 81% choosing strongly support or support, followed by those in Region 1 or Burlington, South Burlington, and Winooski. A majority of respondents expressed support for a MRF bond. Only 8% were opposed. Survey takers were asked why they did or did not support the bond or what additional information they would like to receive if they said they needed more info. Respondents' main reason for support of the bond included environmental benefits, increased in efficiency, additional items accepted, low cost to public, old facility needs to be replaced, increased recycling and or a reduction in landfilling. The main reasons from the 8% of respondents that do not support the bond included need more information, not sure it is needed, and cost. The 7% of residents who wanted more information were interested in more details on the project, including timing and location, quantified benefits and environmental impacts, and budget details. Moving from public perceptions and opinions to trash disposal and recycling choices, Compared to past surveys, there was a big change in what res residents reported as their type of service for their regular trash and recycling. 28% said they use curbside service. This is way down, and I'll talk more about this in a minute. 28% said drop-off center, which is in the range of earlier surveys. 32% said both, which is much higher than in the past. And 12% said they bring their regular trash and recycling to work, which is also higher. A total of 60% said they use curbside service or both curbside and drop-off center. I believe some of the change is a result of the change in survey types. Respondents were not provided with possible answers in the telephone only surveys in the past. In 2021, the mass majority of surveys, as I said, were completed online where options were listed and may have queued the respondents. By listing both curbside and drop-off as a possible response in the online survey, I think that many people with curbside service for trash and recycling selected this response because they also use drop-off centers for what we call special recycling items, such as yard debris, batteries, electronics, tires, appliances. They may think of these as part of their regular waste. Another possible contributor to the change is that a third of respondents said they bring food scraps to drop-off centers and likely consider this part of their regular trash and recycling. This compares with 9% in the 2019 survey. This is probably the result of the ban on food scraps disposal that went into effect in 2020. Eighty-one percent of curbside customers said they use docks for special recyclables. 87% of all respondents use the docks for some purpose, which is similar to the last few surveys. This chart shows drop-off center use over time and the trend has been up. The average rating of trash and recycling service is a little off of what it was in 2019, but still high at 8.3 on a scale of one to 10. Individuals who have lived in Chittenden County longer than five years had a statistically significant higher mean of 8.5, as did those who own their home with a mean of 8.4. Means were also higher for individuals residing in Region 1, Burlington, South Burlington, Winooski, and Region 3, which includes Essex, Essex Junction, and Williston, with means of 8.4. The lowest rating overall with a mean of 8.1 came from individuals who rent their homes.
Of those that work outside the home in Chittenden County, 81% said their employer has a recycling program. This is a 10% drop since the last survey. Perhaps people were more honest in the online version of the survey than those that had been interviewed on the phone in the last survey, as we discussed earlier, or there's been a drop in programs. 78% said their employer has a food scrap collection program, a big jump over previous surveys, possibly because of the food scrap ban. It is still surprising though, since most businesses don't generate any food residuals, except perhaps for employee generated meal waste and many businesses or their employees may have set up in-house programs to manage it. This graph shows the percent of employers with recycling programs over time, including the dip in 2021. And this graph shows the same for food scrap diversion programs with the big jump in 2021. Moving on to waste diversion at home, 92% of respondents said they recycle at least some of their recyclables at home. It's disappointing that 25% said they put some or all of their recyclables in the trash. The decrease in recycling participation might again be explained by the change in survey type. Respondents being more honest about their behavior when not speaking directly to an interviewer. It may also be at least partially attributable to the pandemic and that some people were reluctant to go to drop-off centers, as well as the fact that some drop-off centers were closed for several months before the survey was conducted. Among the 25% of respondents who reported that they put at least some recyclables in the trash, residents in Region 2, which includes Colchester and Milton, and Region 4, Charlotte, Hinesburg, Huntington, Richmond, Shelburne, and St. George, engaged in this practice to a significantly higher extent than re residents in other regions, 35% and 32% respectively, as did individuals living in the county for two years or less at 43%. 91% of respondents said they divert at least some of their yard trimmings from disposal. 66% of respondents said they divert all or don't generate any. 25% of respondents said they divert some of their yard trimmings and dispose some of their yard trimmings. This is up from 1% in 2019. 10% burn or put their yard trimmings in their trash. This is up from 4% in the last survey. Overall, residents in Region 2, Colchester and Milton, reported the highest rates for composting yard trimmings at home and for using a drop-off center for composting. However, they also reported the highest rate for putting at least some trimmings in the trash. Again, some of the changes we see compared to the last survey may be the result of respondents being more likely to report socially unacceptable behavior in an online format or due to impacts of the pandemic. Regarding how households manage food scraps, 74% say they currently divert all of their food scraps from disposal. Most use a combination of diversion methods. 51% say they compost at least some of their scraps at home. 40% use a garbage disposal. One third bring food scraps to drop-off centers. And almost a third say they set out at least some of their food scraps for pickup by a hog. 15% of respondents said they divert some and dispose some of their food scraps. Only 11% of respondents said they put all of their food scraps in the trash, down from 23% in 2019, perhaps due to the food scrap disposal ban going into effect in 2020. In 2015, 37% said they put all of their food scraps in the trash. So we've come a long way over a few years. There was a big jump in the percentage of respondents reporting that they put at least some of their food scraps in a garbage disposal from 15% in 2019 to 40% in 2021, perhaps due to implementation of Act 148. Though use of garbage disposals is acceptable under Act 148, it is not considered a best practices option for most in our district. And this may be an area to add to the list for increased awareness. There was a significant drop in the percent of respondents that said they divert all of their hazardous waste from disposal. 
and a significant increase in the percent that said they divert some of their hazardous waste and dispose some, including in the trash or down the drain. There was also an increase in the percent that said they disposed all of their hazardous waste in the trash. It is possible that the pandemic accounted for some of the increase in improper disposal methods because they would be the easiest ways to get rid of hazardous waste when people were forced to stay home. The depot closed for a month and the rover didn't operate in the previous 2020 season. It is also possible that respondents were more truthful in their online responses and having the options listed prompted more complete answers. Residents in Region 5, Bolton, Jericho, Underhill, and Westford were more likely than others to report that they put at least some of their leftover hazardous products down the drain, while residents in Region 4, Charlotte, Hinesburg, Huntington, Richmond, Shelburne, and St. George were more likely to report they put at least some of these items in their trash. Additionally, homeowners and county residents of two years or less were significantly more likely to use these two improper disposal methods. We may want to consider targeting these segments with added communication efforts to inform residents about the health and safety issues related to these two disposal methods. I understand there was some concern expressed at the last board meeting about the increases in disposal stated. So I want to add some additional information. First, the last uh, residential waste composition study was conducted in 2020 with samples taken in August and November in the thick of the pandemic. Hazardous waste items were separated and weighed. Only 0.2% of the waste sorted was identified as household hazardous waste, or about 12 and a half pounds out of almost 6,400 pounds. And that weight included the container the material was in. The goal of course is zero hazardous waste in the landfill. So we do need to continue our education efforts. Second, the question asked was, what does your household do with leftover hazardous products? For example, chemicals, paint, automotive fluids, pesticides, batteries, fluorescent lamps, mercury containing products. Not all batteries are banned from disposal. And until fairly recently, there was no recycling option for many of them. Some people may have included these in trash disposal. Also latex paint is not hazardous and some residents may have disposed of this in their trash. We don't have any detail on what they specifically put in their trash or down the drain that they defined as hazardous waste. We may wanna add follow-up questions in future surveys. But the bottom line is we don't know for sure from the survey what percent of respondents put actual hazardous waste in the trash or down the drain or whether that practice has really increased or not since the last survey. For the first time, direct mail was not the top choice for receiving new information about trash recycling and composting. Instead, the top choices were email, newspapers, and television, including access online. As with other questions, some of the changes we see may be the result of the change in survey types. Providing online respondents with a list of possible responses may have prompted more accurate and complete answers. Also, more, more people may be comfortable accessing information digitally. Overall, there was an increase in preference for every means of communication except the use of direct mail. Overall, I think we can conclude from the survey that district facilities and programs enjoy high participation, residents are satisfied with their trash and recycling service, and most use appropriate methods to manage their waste. While respondents are satisfied with their current trash and recycling services, a large majority supports a consolidated, a consolidated system for curbside pickup of trash recycling and food scraps. CSWD should continue to support communities considering consolidated collection and assist with communicating the benefits of this type of system. There is strong support for a MRF bond Financial details and information on the benefits and environmental impact of a new MRF should, of course, be widely communicated before the vote. Most residents have a positive impression of CSWD and want increased communications. 
use of digital media appears to be a good strategy to reach our members. Newer residents should be targeted with info on proper disposal of hazardous waste, recyclables, and yard trimmings. And we may wanna look at targeting particular communities. And finally, all residents and businesses should continue to be reminded about what materials should not go in the trash or down the drain and why. Are there any questions or comments? Can we go back to the full uh, full screen, Nancy, just so we can see all the commissioners? Sure. Thank you. I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, very thorough, a lot of great information in there. Um, I did have one observation that it seems like our positive uh, perception in the, in the community um, recently still comes despite uh, some of the negative press that we might have uh, received in the last couple of years about our, our NOAV and, and our glass issue. I don't know if you have any comments on that. I do. In um, when we asked people, or people were asked what um, what improvements they would like to see, there was only one comment that referred to the glass. So I don't know. I mean, uh, some people may not have, you know, thought of that when thinking of improvements. <laughs> Uh, but that was something that, that only one person actually mentioned. Other comments and questions from commissioners? Bryn. Yeah, I wanna thank you as well for um, the thoroughness of the survey. I think it's extremely insightful. Um, it is intriguing to see the change um, in responses uh, from phone in relation to online responses. Um, I guess I'm one one question I have out of curiosity is um, when is the next survey and um, who will have the honor of doing that for CSWD? Um. It is. It will be in the budget if it's not already um, uh, in uh, marketing and communications. So Michelle will take the lead on that with Elise. Um, and I haven't seen that budget, so I don't know if it's in for uh, next spring. Usually, the actual survey takes place late, very end of the fiscal year, um, and. Uh, so it would need to be in the FY23 budget if it's gonna occur next year. We certainly will miss you uh, and your thorough um, special projects. So thank you for um, the presentation tonight. Thanks, Bryn. Um, and thank you also for speaking um, to the HHW component. Um, I certainly think that as we, um, look at any toxics that could um, be in leachate, um, anything that CSWD can do to um, uh, provide additional education um, and just awareness about our services um, mm -hmm. is just uh, added benefit to the, the um, you know, the greater community in, of Vermont, um, generally speaking. So, you know, thinking from our, you know, core community here, but expanding out into um, the destination of, of where those materials go via, um, via uh, wastewater treatment plants, um, landfill, et cetera. So um, I do um, look forward to seeing additional outreach education on that. Um, and, uh, and I think that leads into some of the next um, presentations from Josh, Josh Esty too. So, um, one follow-up that might be for Jen Holiday. I don't recall there being any EPR this year um, or extended producer responsibility for HHW, um, but maybe you can jog my memory on that. Um, just if there was anything in the legislature. Yeah, thanks, Bren. Um, there was a bill for the legislature 
Uh, this is the second year of the biennium. It was introduced last year um, and it passed the House uh, this year and made it over to the Senate and it was in pretty good shape to get through the Senate, but it just we just ran out of time. The Senate uh, Environmental Committee is completely uh, inundated with bills to get out and this did not make the top of the list, unfortunately, but I think we will pursue it again next year. We can find sponsors easily enough. And I think because this is um, actually the third iteration of an EPR for HHW bill, it's been going on for six years now. Um, legislators are pretty familiar with the concept, with the, the ideas and supportive. So it's just a matter of getting, getting the time to get it through. All right, thank you for the, re the refresher. Uh, Josh, your hand is up. Yeah, I just, um, w I've talked a lot with Nancy and with Sarah uh, separately about um, doing some of that outreach specifically around HHW because obviously those responses are concerning. Um, and I, I like the approach that is laid out in the survey results in, in especially reaching out to those communities that were more, more than likely to have responded in those ways that we don't want. Um, I will say one thing that I that I did uh, with the help of Nancy is, is look at those um, uh, those waste sort surveys, uh, the results, and just to see, you know, what types of materials they were pulling out as hazardous waste. Um, because I'm, I was concerned and, and still am partially concerned that it's a, a reduction of um, access to HHW events uh, that's causing that. Um, you know, by and large though, it's materials that we take at all of our facilities, including the drop-off centers that were found in that waste sort survey. So I think it's probably just a, a, a broader uh, issue of HHW disposal and, and, and knowledge out there. Um, and, and some follow-up questions I think would help sort of refine those results and give us, you know, the more detailed information that we're looking for, um, given those things that Nancy pointed out, you know, what, what type of materials are they really talking about putting down the drain? and throwing in the trash and are they receiving the messages that we're putting out there like if you dry your latex paint cans out you can throw them in the trash you know those types of um educational points that we try to make when we host rover events or we get you know people down at the depot and and try to save people trips to the depot or save people trips to the rover and not necessarily um venture out every time they have an empty aerosol can that they want to get rid of so you know i, I think doing a little more of a deep dive into those surveys, survey responses would uh, sort of give us a lot more information. I, I, I hope that we can, we can do that. Thank you. And this is uh, late in this discussion, but a reminder that HHW stands for household waste. Um, and when we, when we do abbreviations and acronyms, it's always good to remember to try to explain what they may be. Other comments? Uh, thank you again, Nancy, very much for, for this presentation and for your years of, of expert service uh, um, to the district and to the board. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are now ready to move on to um, item number seven on the agenda, uh, the 2022 Rover schedule that appears on page 115 of the board packet. Um, Sarah or Josh? Yeah, we'll turn that over to Josh Esty, please. Um, I, I won't bore with you with just rehashing the memo. I, I will take the opportunity to say, if anybody knows of anyone looking for a job, we have lots of great openings at the depot and would be happy to uh, receive a resume for those jobs. Uh, we are certainly struggling in that realm and I won't miss an opportunity to make that plug. So um, I just hit the highlights. Um, we heard a lot over the last year since we hosted our first um, post-pandemic rover events that um, people certainly missed the rover coming around um, to their community. Um, and and we, we heard that loud and clear and, and wanted to find a way to, to compromise because we have seen over the years a significant reduction in, in rover visits um, corresponding with a significant increase in um, visitation of the depot. So, 
we wanted to figure out how to how to blend the two um, while also sort of addressing the uh, labor shortages we are seeing um, at the environmental depot in our hazardous waste program. Um, so, so working with Gary Winnie, who's our facility manager, we came up with this blended schedule where whereby we would um, we would have a rover event in each uh, sort of geographic region of the district, um, and then uh, each year go to three three other uh, municipalities and and do an individual event for those towns. Um, by doing that, we we think we're giving um, a, a good opportunity for folks to have a couple uh, sort of cracks at visiting one of the rover events. Um, and then every four years, uh, give those folks who are uh, potentially transportation challenged um, an opportunity to visit the rover uh, or, or find a neighbor that's willing to, to do that for them. So um, this is, you know, just, you know, our, our most recent rendition of, of trying to figure out what's, what's best for the community while sort of uh, balancing the, the realities at the depot as far as labor and um, sort of the, the, the changes in demographics of who's visiting the rover and who's visiting, visiting the depot. So with that, I'm, I'm certainly open to any discussion or any questions and happy to answer them. Thanks, Josh. And, and again, th this is informational and an opportunity for, for engagement and dialogue. No particular, uh, there are no motions behind the, what, what's being presented tonight. Uh, Katie. Yes, uh, I reached out to Josh, who was great. Thank you for responding. Um, I did want to put in uh, a little plug for Westford and getting on the schedule for earlier than year four, um, based on the fact that we don't have a drop-off center close to us, really, and the environmental detail depot is pretty far away. So um, I understand year one's already planned out, but I was hoping that um, we could get a bump from year four. Um, sooner than that. So I'm going to throw that out there. And, and just a reminder, I don't know if Josh had mentioned this, but um, Walter, if there's not a vote needed. And, um, you know, again, this is just kind of a representation of how, how the rotating schedule might work. So we're certainly open to revisiting and taking another look at, at year two. And, and we'll, we'll just continue to evaluate, as Josh mentioned, the usage and the need um, but we can certainly, you know, uh, take another look at years two, three, and four, and just by judging how this first year goes, um, take a look and, and see if we need to adjust. Brent? Yeah, so um, thanks for putting this on the uh, agenda for further conversation. Um, I am thrilled that the rover is coming back. Um, again, just reiterating that Winooski um, is a municipality that does um, have uh, a higher rate of residents that do not own vehicles and that are um, renters. Um, so, um, you know, between the two, um, just a uh, population that may not be able to make it to the depot, um, having a rover is um, a, a, a really um, valuable to our community so that um, we can increase access and, and um, to these services to ensure that they don't end up down the drain or in the trash. Um, I think it's, you know, along the lines of what Katie was just mentioning, um, I think I'd like to see a three-year rotation rather than a four-year rotation. Obviously, there are challenges with um, the labor components, and I leave that to Sarah and the team to navigate um, and I do appreciate the reference to the waste management article. Um, so I'm purely speaking from um, preference um, on that side of things. And it feels like a three-year rotation is um, feels standard for um, a number of inspections um, and that um, it feels uh, like it's just more reasonable time timeline than four. I hear you on that, Brandon, and, and you know I completely understand. When I was managing the Rhode Island program, we had a three-year rotation, um, but we also had a you know more access to kind of event services. Um, this was it's just a different time. Um, you know, I'm glad that Josh put in the plug for you know 
anyone looking for a position, um, a, a good job at the depot, because that is truly the factor right now is the staffing issue. Um, and it, it could be getting a little bit better, you know, with, with um, some colleges availability, maybe, you know, kids are looking for an interesting summer job, but then that brings us back into potential crisis in the fall um, when they go back to school. So it's, we really can't stress enough the dire situation that um, in particular the, the depot is in with staffing. Um, we really could use some help. And I, and I wanna thank all the commissioners who have kind of distributed our, our notes, our pleas on your know, local farm porch forums. It's really important um, to get you know, additional eyeballs on that. And we really appreciate you helping us out with, with those, but that's, we are um, certainly in approaching crisis. And I, I don't want to, this is not a chicken you know, little situation we may be having to have another conversation um, about the sustainability of some of um, these offerings. So we are going to do our very, very best in providing this service this uh, first year, but we need some help from the staffing. It's critical. I, I will say, you know, um, if, if we are staffed up and we have that ability, you know, adding, Adding essentially a rover a year is is not um, a taxing uh, thing, especially if they're on the the smaller scale than they are. But um, the the problem is exacerbated because we we run the depot on the same day, and so we 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 truly are pretty pretty taxed on those days, um, especially when we are holding the Milton, the Essex, uh, the Williston, um, the Jerichos. Those are those are five five person events that, that we run. And then we try to also have three staff at the depot um, just because we're, that's our busiest day at the depot as well. So, um, you know, not, you know, not to be a little, they uh, you know, keep the point pressing, but you know, that, that truly is the kind of limiting factor here is, is, is staffing at this point, so. And is the staffing issue because it's a hazardous uh, exposure to hazardous materials? Not really. And, and you know, it's, it's just the general unemployment level of str you know, struggle that everyone is going through. Um, I, you know, in talking to some of my, uh, my colleagues who, you know, they're the district managers, um, I think of the four or five that I've reached out to in the past month or so, we are all looking for people to work at in either our, their versions of the depot, so the NHHW, um, all looking for seasonal help. Um, some of us are looking for drivers, some of us are looking for mechanics. We're all pulling from the same pool. Um, and it's, you know, it's just the nature of, of where we're at right now. It's not I've had wanting to two open positions since September, yeah. full-time positions, yeah. one mechanic and one recycling driver and almost zero applicants. It's tough. Yeah. Other comments and questions from, uh, from commissioners or staff on, on the Rover at this point? I, I suspect we'll be hearing more about this as, uh, as the year progresses. Uh, then we'll move on, always conscious of the time, um, but we are remarkably on schedule. Um, item number eight, uh, the solid waste management ordinance. Uh, and it's time for the board to take some action on this. It's been presented on several occasions over the last six months or so, I, I think, um, but um, a lot of work has been done. So um, we're ready for action. I, I would hope that Sarah, I'll turn it over to you and perhaps Josh. Yes, um, we'll turn over to Josh and um, also Janine McCrum is here too. They both put in a uh, tremendous amount of work on, on this over the past six months, as you said. Um, so Josh, I will let you kind of describe the process that we've had to date and um, ask you to before the recommendations. I know we've had some, you know, we've had some comments um, from the, the public and, you know, we, I just would like Josh, if you can run through kind of how we've responded to 
some of those comments and, and uh, what we feel some of the next steps may be in providing a couple of those in particular. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, I do want to just recognize how much time staff has put into this. It's been a, a long haul. Um, a, it's been a over a year and a half process this, as process at this point. Um, and uh, particularly call out uh, the work that Janine has done um, keeping us organized and on track. It's uh, invaluable, certainly. So I, I do appreciate that and want to make sure that's um, recognized. So um, we brought the proposed changes to the executive board in December. Um, early January, we uh, sent out a hauler newsletter to the hauling community, um, giving them the heads up that uh, these proposed changes were coming down the line, um, giving them the, the early opportunity to review and respond um, to the changes. And then at the January full board meeting, January 26th, uh, we came to the board requesting um, approval to go out to public comment period, a 30-day public comment period, um, during which we did hold a public meeting. Um, we did not have any members of the public show up, um, but we did have comments from uh, board of commissioners at that January 26th meeting, um, as well as from um, two members of the hauling community, uh, Myers and Casella, um, and incorporated those comments into a responsive summary, which was included in your board packet for this evening. Um, there were uh, sort of uh, mixed reactions to the comments that were received. A lot of good points were made and, and some concessions made on our part. Um, and I won't go through the specifics on those since they were sent to you. Um, I will just say that um, on Monday, I sent over our responsive summary, summary to those who had submitted comments um, and actually received comments back uh, for a second time last night um, uh, from Casella. Um, so they were addressing some of the comments that we had made in our responsiveness summary, um, which needless to say, complicates things a little bit here tonight, um, given that they were additional comments made, albeit outside of the uh, public comment period. Um, but there's, there is one one comment in particular that uh, Janine and I discussed this afternoon and, and feel like uh, maybe uh, should be incorporated into the, to the proposed changes. So um, I think there are a couple paths forward um, and Sarah, you know, this is uh, sort of new to you, but one is to um, have the discussion here tonight, get any final comments from board members um, and, and move this agenda item to um, next month's meeting where we can provide an update to the responsiveness summary, um, or I can try to, um, I can pull up the comments that I received yesterday, go over the one comment that we agree with and would like to incorporate and move forward with uh, a vote tonight on the ordinance. And uh, you know, I sort of defer to you, Sarah, and you, Paul, on, on which path we want to move forward with, uh, knowing how long of a haul this has sort of been and without knowing what the May agenda looks like for the full board. Um, Paul, just for um, maybe for additional consideration, I think the key point that Josh just made was that the comments on the comments um, are not part of the official comment period. Um, a lot of use of the word comment, so it doesn't. The board is not beholden to accepting them as an official comment. However, as, as you said, they you certainly can. Um, consider what the comment is. However, that should you should not feel like you need to then delay yet another month. If you feel like you have enough information as a board um, and that the comment is, is again coming, uh, the reflection is coming from staff as appropriate to be considered, there's not a, a compelling reason nor a legal reason to wait another month um, to make a vote. So you certainly would be within your, your um, purview and prerogative as a board to continue the process tonight if you like. There's also, I, I was gonna say, there's also no harm in, in kicking it down the road other than it's just another item on the May agenda. And you'll have to refresh me uh, what, what the May agenda looks like um, right now. Um, you'll be happy to know it's not nearly as large as this one. Um, <laughs> so we have um, a couple of items that will need approval. We are reviewing, reviewing the annual organizational meeting, um, what that looks like. It's, it's a lot less substantive 
happened tonight. So. Um, my my reaction is always I I never know where a good idea comes from. Uh, I think it's it's always worthwhile um, entertaining ideas and thoughts and and, and engaging with all of the constituencies. Um, it shows good faith on everybody's part and and working these things through. Um, you know, I was pleased to see that there was dialogue going back and forth. Um, staff was hearing some of the comments from from Casella and um, and Myers. I thought that was that was a good thing. Um, <clears throat> So if it's time for me to make a decision tonight, um, I guess I'd kind of kick it back. If they can, you know, you've reviewed it. I, I, there, with one change that you're that you're recommending, if that can be uh, concisely presented tonight, and we can uh, accommodate that into our brains, um, I, I guess I'd be inclined to to pursue that tonight. Um, and Paul Tom does have his hand raised. I just want to. Yeah. So um, and we always work to the will of the board. It's not just me. So. Uh, um, Tom, you had a comment, and then Brandon, um, then, uh, then we'll decide what we're going to do. Yeah, so I, I don't understand the requirement to collect recyclables at least as often as trash. Um, at our condo association in Jericho, we chose to have a biweekly um, collection of recyclables. And we were offered the option of weekly, but we chose to go biweekly to save money. So Josh, I think if you could um, address that after we decide if we're going to add the other item over to you today. So let's um, put a pin in that question for Tom, but we will get to that, thank you. Uh, Bryn, do you have a, a comment on, on this particular question that might, might lead us in one direction or another? Yeah, I do, thank you for the opportunity. Um, there were changes made to a particular section of the ordinance. Um, after the commissioners had a chance to provide our first round of comments. So I believe the, the commissioners had our chance to provide some comments and then it went to public comment. Now I'm seeing um, the public comment response and CSWD's response to those comments for the first time. Um, and I, my preference would be to at least um, move, the, move the conversation to May so that, um, Commissioners can have a chance to um, have to to think about the impact and repercussions of some of the proposed changes that were made in following the public comment. Thank you, and I um, uh, I really appreciate that, Bryn, and and um, you know I think you've got some you know you, you think deeply about this, and we've got to work our way through it. So um, I think it's a very helpful comment to uh, to move this discussion item over to May. But again, this is really that subject to the will of the board. If there's a serious objection to that, um, yeah. then we, we can continue tonight. But, um, yes, Janine, and then Tim. You're muted, Janine. I got it. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, one of the things that I would uh, um, like to understand too, if we're going to do that, if they're, you know, brain obviously has a, a particular concern with the things that have been presented in the responsiveness summary. If there are other commissioners that have read through that have similar things, just so we could be comprehensive in our, in our response and, you know, not kind of do one here and then one there. And um, so I, I don't know how, how, much people have looked at it or how, how deeply they've read, but if there are other concerns or, or particular concerns that commissioners have, we'd, we'd be appreciate knowing that, you know, Sounds now, fun. and then we can kind of address everything in, in May, if that makes sense. That's a point well taken. Thanks, Janine. Uh, Tim, your hand was up, it came down. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm, I'm, I'm just a, a little bit confused. It sounds like we, so we, we've gone through the process, we we've proposed the changes, we've received feedback, but now uh, Josh has said that we've, we have additional feedback and we're not sure if we should push forward, but we don't know what that feedback is or what it was in reference to. Am I correct or am I missing something? I, I have not presented the feedback that we've received since the packet went out, that is correct. I, I think that the issue is a matter of time uh, and, and brain power that we have tonight. Not only the issue that, that Josh has not fleshed out for us, but also the issue that Bryn has uh, raised um, that might actually take a, a bit of time and, and, and clarity to, for the commissioners to, uh, to weigh on. Bryn. 
Um, I guess I just have a procedural question. Um, it may be worth uh, articulating what you know what the changes are proposed or the comments to the comments, um, and then procedurally, I'm curious if there's a need to remove those topics from question um, and being able to move forward with the remainder of the ordinance. Um, and then like if uh, another round of public comment or public hearing needs to be made. So it's, I'm not articulating that well, but basically do we need to move, remove the items in question? Can we move forward on voting on everything else? Um, and then for the items that are still in question, do we have to go back out for public comment? I would sort of be interested in hearing uh, if Thomas has an opinion on this, but the, the way I understand the, the process is that we are not beholden to the public comment period, especially since we have already been out for the public comment period once before on the vast majority of changes. Um, and that that is sort of above and beyond what the what the requirements are set forth in Vermont statute um, that we could we could move forward um, with taking uh, comments tonight and uh, updating the responsiveness summary based on the comments we received yesterday, as well as any additional uh, comments that commissioners have, um, amending the responsiveness summary, uh, providing that perhaps farther in advance this time uh, in advance of the May meeting um, so that we could vote on the full uh, solid waste management ordinance in May, um, if only because when we approve of the ordinance uh, within 14 days, that has to be posted in a paper and in five public places. So um, getting into that uh, changes the, the timing a little bit as far as getting that out in the paper and uh, posting it in public. So I, I'm wary of doing it that way. I'd rather do it wholesale. Um, and, and I don't believe, and again, I, I hope Thomas can weigh in that there's a, there's a reason why we would have to go out for, for that public comment period again. Thomas, can you um, weigh in? I see Mike uh, Casella, your hand is up. We'll get to you in a moment. Yeah, yes, so so I think that the the fact that you've had the solicited the public input, um, you know, I, I, I think if you want to approve the changes that have been um, vetted so far and are being presented, if you want to ad adopt that, you can certainly, uh, you know, ad adopt it. Um, but in order for the uh, uh, amendments to become effective, uh, there is a process of uh, posting a, a, a formal notice of it. Uh, and then within the six, a 45 day period of time, uh, if you have more than 5% of the voters within the district petition, uh, then the, the question of the ordinance amendments need, need to be put to a, uh, to a public vote. I don't see a, a clear process by which you say, well, you know, we'll approve these, but we won't go, those won't go into effect until we consider some other changes. I think if, if that's the approach that the, the board wants to take, I think you're better off delaying it and, and, until you see what, what additional uh, changes are, are, are being implemented. I don't, I'm not aware of any other requirement that, that you then uh, have to go back out with uh, uh, a public hearing or or request for additional public comments um, since since you have received held a public hearing and have already received those public comments. Uh, I, 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 as the chair, would agree. I think we need to 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 wrap this up and do it all at once and not not pass part of it and then go back and through an amendment process. I think whether or not uh, we have to deal with the public. Um, issues and notification issues. It just makes much more sense to to deal with this in one in, in one concise action. Um, Mike Casella, I'm interested in hearing what you might want to have to contribute on this, and then we'll make a decision. No, absolutely. We, we would love more time. I think we submitted our comments on February eighth, and we didn't receive anything back till the twenty eighth uh, or the twenty fifth. So oh, hey. we any response from staff so we, we want to just do it right we have a lot of customers that this can impact and actually even in one of the responses actually when i looked at the ordinance to what the response was on that you must do recycling uh weekly to match you know the weekly trash service 
actually that got addressed in the responses that that was going to be uh, removed, which I, when I look at the ordinance, it's not. So I, I just think from my standpoint, we're, we're willing to work through these things, but there are a lot of concerns that we did submit on February 8th. Um, Tim. Um, I don't know how many can, uh, comments were, were received after the fact that we don't have visibility to, but does it make sense to have discussion on uh, topics that we haven't received additional feedback on since we're all here, we've been nominally prepped for it? with the understanding that we're not going to approve or disapprove, but for discussion topics. I, I'd be happy to, I, I see Janine has her hand up. I'd be, I'd be happy to pull up the comments that we received from Casella yesterday and, and re, re, review them um, if, that's, if that's what you're asking. No, actually, it's just the opposite, Josh. It's, I do, if, if we look at the, you know, I, I don't remember the exact number of items that we received feedback on, but let's just assume that there were 10. Assuming that Casella gave, gave additional feedback that we don't that we don't have visibility to on three of those, should we discuss the other seven issues, or do we just want to table the entire thing until May? I see. Janine. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that I think that's what I was trying to articulate earlier, Tim. Um, was you know if there are additional comments. Um, if there are comments from the board on on the responsiveness summary that that we presented, um, you know, uh, I, I think it would be worthwhile to hear those. Um, you know, whether we do it now verbally or um, I think that would be our preference. But you know, understanding um, again that we are trying to give a comprehensive and ju and just to be clear, the the responses, the the, the comments that you haven't seen yet are kind of responses to our responsiveness summary, if you will. So it's not like these are new um, things that are addressed. It's just, you know, they were responses to our summary and we, some of those, we might say, yeah, that's a valid point. Some we might say, you know, we like where we are. So um, I just wanted to be clear that it's not, these aren't brand new things being raised, um, but yes, yeah, so it would be helpful, Tim, for us, I think if we could hear other concerns that that commissioners or if there are other people here that would like to voice those at this time, that would be great. Okay, what I'm going to say then is we have on our agenda, this discussion was to go through 920. It's now about 905. So let's give this another 10 to 15 minutes with pretty much a hard stop at that point. Uh, we're, we're in discussion mode here, information sharing. Uh, we'll, we'll do what we can till, till 920 and then we'll move on to the next agenda item. So Josh, if you could start then with um, reflecting on Tom's comment about the, um, the requirement to have uh, suggestion to have collection at least as often um, recycling and trash. That was Tom Jocelyn's question from earlier. Sure. Um, we actually um, removed that requirement for commercial haulers to collect um, uh, solid waste destined for disposal. Uh, sorry, mandatory recyclables at least as often as uh, solid waste testing for disposal. Um, we removed that requirement for commercial haulers. However, we kept it for um, multi-residential uh, uh, units. So, uh, uh, so you, uh, f buildings with more than five units, essentially. Um, mandatory recyclables will have to be collected at least as often as uh, solid waste testing for disposal with the caveat that there is an exemption process in place by which um, the, the district can be notified that that exemption is being requested and we can approve it on a case-by-case -case basis. Tim, your hands Tim. up. Yeah, can, Josh, can you please refer to the, to the handout of which you, you know, everything is listed as a C number, which one are you referring to here? Sure. Um, uh, let me just see. Um, C6? C yeah. C6, C6 is, is the hauler requirement that we removed. I don't know. You're saying that you're, you're rescinding it 
except for multi for uh, multi unit housing. It's a it's a different section. This this section applies to uh, commercial hauler requirements, and then there's a there's a separate section um, for requirements for uh, multi unit residential in in generator requirements that that change was also made in, um, and it's it's being kept in that in that section. I guess I you know I would just I look at this and I. I don't think it's a good idea for CSWD to try and step in between the haul, haulers and their customers, as long as they're meeting the, the requirements of, uh, it, as long as they're providing services that allow the customers to meet the requirements overall to go ahead and, and dispose of their trash and the recycling in an appropriate fashion, but we shouldn't dictate frequency. You know, they, I, I don't see a lot of value here. Thanks, Tim. Alan. Um, you know, I guess I would like to know what the, the reasoning behind the multifamily every week pickup is because, I mean, these haulers are in business to make money and they have roots set up. And, uh, you know, I know like right now we they pick up our recycling every other week, but they also stop at an apartment house that's, uh, you know, a quarter mile down the road. And they would need to send their truck out every week to pick that up, but not pick up, you know, our development. I just doesn't, I, you know, time-wise, I don't, somebody's got to tell me what the advantage of picking up every week at a multi-unit complex is, is for. Yeah, and we're not we're not proposing um, weekly collection. We're, we're proposing that it gets collected as often as uh, solid, as solid waste doesn't for disposal. But most solid waste because of the summertime heat and everything is picked up every week. Bryn. Thanks. Um, in terms of best practices, it really is advised that recycling and trash are collected at the same time. Um, with curbside services, it gets very confusing for residents on what day, which type of material is supposed to be set out. Um, so I would be, I'm highly in favor of what CSWD is proposing um, in terms of as frequently as solid waste collection. Um, I think if folks are really maximizing and, and recycling up properly, they will actually have more recyclables than trash. Um, and it would be in, uh, an interesting study to see how many um, totes are out there that have uh, vacant space um, because folks are recycling more um, because there are more materials that can and should be recycled than trash. So if anything, I think would think frequency for recycling should be more than trash. But again, that's not a good practice because then people will um, behavior wise, education wise, they will um, inappropriately put trash with in their recyclables and that will degrade our quality of product at the MRF. So um, I disagree with Tim. Ken. You're muted. Uh, yep, I just wanted to agree that um, anecdotally that my recycle uh, put out quantity is, is higher than my trash quantity. Just want to back up grin on that one for myself. Uh, Lee and then Kelton. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. So in Burlington, we have weekly pickup and I think um, in regard to consolidated collection, one of the, the big options would be an every other week recycling pickup or, you know, those options um, that we have explored. And just knowing, you know, going out on a truck myself, I've grabbed onto a 95 gallon container, rolled it up to the truck, flipped the lid open, there's one newspaper in it. Um, you know, it's just, but these people are 
train that recycling comes every week and you know that's what they do um i think there's an education piece to it um i don't think it's ever going to change in burlington as far as weekly or bi-weekly pickup um so yeah i don't know i'm kind of on the fence with this one it, it, it definitely contradict options in consolidated collection that um you know we just saw the presentation on and that that we've had our own study with. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Kelton. Yep, I would I would just caution to say anecdotally, everybody on this call probably <clears throat> recycles more than they put in their trash versus what happens in reality. Um, I think you got a very engaged audience here. Um, so just from seeing what happens in in reality in the every in the everyday working you know working in this industry um i would just say that's not the case for everybody and i would just put that out there and and part of that is why in our response um our six we we sort of acknowledge that um we have that same anecdotal information that you know recycling bins are are overflowing while trash bins stand empty, but we haven't been able to, to quantify that information yet. And without that strong um, data to back up the decision on the on the hauler piece, um, you know, that's why um, we've sort of moved to uh, to move that down the road, um, but maintaining uh, sort of a focus on it so that we we can try to justify that change in the future because we we hold the position which is why we proposed the change to begin with that that Bryn and Ken have uh, put forward uh, but we want to just be able to back it up with good data uh, Bryn um, and I also want to speak to just the broader picture of should we build and structure the system for how it should work and how we are striving towards making it work, um, especially with looking towards bonding a new um, recycling facility, or should we um, uh, create a system that uh, reinforces the status quo? Alan? I have a recycling container that's twice as large as my trash container. And so they come every two weeks and it works out very well. And these guys are in the business and they know what they're doing. And I don't think that we ought to be, you know, limiting what they, you know, can do. I don't want to see my trash rates go up because they got to go to the apartment house down the road every week to pick up recycling. And Tim, um, yeah, Tim. Yeah, well said, Alan. You know, we're, we're we, CSWD is not a hauler. And our haulers have commercial relationships with all of their customers who are our constituents. We should not, we can absolutely go ahead and place requirements on the haulers if they're going to go ahead and bring uh, recyclables or MSW into our facilities. We should not inject ourselves into their the relationship between the haulers and their customers. We can certainly put incentives in place to go ahead and incentivize good behavior, but we should not place requirements. And there, you know, there's, I'm trying to remember where the, the most interesting issue, we've got one, the really interesting example, like C10 talks about the, the fact that, okay, we're gonna find the hauler with the expectation that they're going to go ahead and pass that that fine through to their customer, right? With there's, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any legal power there. It, but that's a really good example of the fact that we're going, we're placing, we're trying to in, inject ourselves in between the hauler and their customer, and I don't think that's our role at all. I think it's inappropriate. Other comments to on the uh, solid waste management uh, ordinance to get before the before other commissioners and and staff before we move on to the next item. Yes, Bryn. 
Yeah, I. Um, it's interesting you bring up um, section uh, 413 or comment C10. Um, that ordinance was um, previously adopted and has been in effect for um, six and a half, seven years. So um, clearly it is um, a legal structure that has been in place. Um, and my comment actually relates to section 413 um, in, in that I don't agree with um, the proposed, some of the proposed changes um, as presented. Um, I think it's uh, a bad policy decision to um, in effect uh, have a municipal mandate that allows that um, issues a penalty on generators that is retained um, entirely by um, uh, by the private sector without without any uh, parameters around how that money that's collected is spent. Um, I think if it if there were some directives that the money that's collected needs to be utilized for education programs, then I would be more comfortable with um, with section four, um, 4.13, but as presented here, I can't support this. Katie. Um, I'd just like to say too about um, 413 that again, what Bryn said, this has been um, actually a part of the ordinance since I worked there. Um, this was enacted as the banned materials fee at the transfer station. And it was um, actually, um, we had uh, a system where the transfer station would be in, in communication about these types of loads and it did work. Um, and it's been in there for, for a long time. Um, the, it, there is an incentive actually in the ordinance for people caught in its um, unit-based pricing which is um, people that have the incentive to recycle more because it is cost less than disposing of trash in, 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 in essence. Um, the unit-based pricing gave people a reasonable economic incentive to dispose of less trash and recycle more. So there is incentive in the ordinance as well. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as part of incentives for um, the ordinance. Thanks, Katie. Uh, we are approaching 920. Uh, any final comments? Um, clearly, we're going to be discussing this again in May. Um, but a good opportunity to get some of these issues out and, and aired. Tim. How much time are we going to allocate to this in May? You have a suggestion. A, a lot. I think these are some, these are very significant issues. This is some very deep philosophical stuff. And just because something's been in place for six years doesn't mean that it was appropriate when it was passed. Can I also reiterate um, Janine's request that, um, that the board provide us some additional feedback. Um, now that you've seen uh, this part of the responsiveness summary, um, Josh, I think we can probably get the additional item out to the board as follow-up so that you have kind of the fullness of what we've received to date. Um, but if commissioners, if you could, again, get your, your concerns, your thoughts, even you know if they're not quite formed, um, just get some responses back to us so that we can again, incorporate that into the next month's meeting um, and then to hopefully kind of help to structure some of the conversation that would be very, very helpful. Leslie, last I comment. just have a process question. If we're gonna handle this in May, are we gonna sort of take it section by section? Uh, because, you know, this evening we've had sort of, essentially people pick one or two issues you know, in sort of random fashion, I'd like to suggest that to the extent we're going to devote considerable time 
on this, as Tim has suggested in May, that we go through it in a deliberative section by section so we can at least dispose of certain sections and then we might flag something where we need more work or whatever, you know, and I just feel that this kind of approach is not efficient and uh, hope we can do it a little more efficiently in May. I think that makes a lot of sense. We can certainly take each um, each change and corresponding comments in turn. All right, I'm going to say we've reached the, the, our allotted time for discussion on this. Um, time to now move on to item number nine, the executive session, uh, which is informational that Sarah will present. Earlier today, she sent out the link to the executive session, so we'll uh, entertain a motion now to enter executive session. Uh, um, I have, that, have the I language. Can, yes, I move that the Board of Commissioners of the Chittenden Solid Waste District go into executive session to discuss contract negotiations with respect to the City of Burlington Flint Avenue property, where premature general public knowledge would clearly place the district, its member municipalities, and other public bodies or persons involved at a substantial disadvantage and to permit authorized staff, other invited interested parties and the solid waste district attorney to be present for this session. So move Jericho. Wilson. Thank you. All those in favor of entering executive session, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Seeing none, we will move over into executive session. Uh, we're willing to entertain a motion to exit executive session. So moved, Essex. Thank you. A second? second? Second, Burlington. Thank you, Lee. Presume there's no discussion on this. All those in favor of exiting executive session, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are now back in public session. Um, I think we're ready for a motion, um, if it could be read out by Sarah. Chairman, be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners of the Jindan Solid Waste District authorizes the Executive Director to extend the MOU with the City of Burlington under the same terms and conditions to no later than December 31, 2022. I'll move Essex. Thank you, Alan. A second? Second, Jericho. Can I just clarify something? Should I recuse myself from this vote? Yes. Okay, yeah. I, re I recuse myself. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor I just, of- Sorry, I just wanna confirm our word. So we're gonna to continue to receive payments per the original schedule. Same terms and conditions. Correct. That's. Okay, we're ready for the question. All those in yep. favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Lee, I think you could. Um... Mr. Recusal. Recused. Motion carries. The last item on the agenda is other business. Um, is there any other business to bring before the board tonight? No. Adjournment. I, I wanna compliment uh, Sarah or Amy, whoever did the projections on the schedule. It was spot on. It's 9.57, <laughs> um, only two minutes. Thank you up. all, appreciate you all. <laughs> a long meeting, but uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second, Westford. Thank you all. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Good night, Good night all. everyone.